the Today Show's newest fan. Little Al Roker. Hello and welcome to the Royal Rundown. This one is the best yet, which is not saying too much since it's only our second show. They just keep getting better and better. I'm Keir Simmons in front of Kensington Palace. Why are we here? Because Catherine, Princess of Wales, lived here until last summer. And drum roll, this episode is all about Kate. She just stepped into the spotlight to champion a cause that is close to her heart, making sure young children get a great start in life. Why did she choose to lead on this? Is she becoming more independent now? And aside from the future of our children, could the future of the whole royal family depend on her? Goodness me, we have questions. But there's no question there is more to Kate than this new important effort. Who is she as a mom? What will her legacy be? And how did she build her own family? We'll get into all that and more in the next half hour. But first, Molly Hunter with the latest on what the palace is calling Princess Kate's life's work. The Princess of Wales is stepping into the spotlight as she launches her biggest solo project yet. Introducing Shaping Us, a campaign to raise awareness for early childhood education. It is essential to not only understand the unique importance of our earliest years, but to know what we can all do to help raise future generations of happy, healthy adults. The new campaign officially launched back in early February. By focusing our collective time, energy and resources on these most preventative years, we can make a huge difference. And she kicked off the campaign solo on stage wearing a bright red suit, her husband, the Prince of Wales, in the audience at a glitzy star-studded event at BAFTA. Later, visiting the iconic Leeds Kirkgate Market that week, meeting with students in the Childhood Studies program at the University of Leeds. So nice to see you. And joining Thank radio you. host yeah, Roman yeah, Kemp really to share really the mission of the campaign. For yourself as a mother, was this something that you wanted to learn for you as, as well as like putting it out there? Yeah, absolutely. And the key things that I, you sort of, I've come away with and what I've learned the most is, mm. and which is what the science says really, is that the importance of having healthy and strong relationships in a child's life is really critical having a nurturing environment and having experiences in which a child can really understand and discover not only themselves but also the world in which they live. Mm. You know, these are the key things that we should really be focusing on. According to the Royal Foundation Centre for Early Childhood, only one in five people in the United Kingdom understand the importance of those first five years, where the brain develops more than at any other age. Shaping Us is heavily focused on the science and released this claymation film across the country. The Princess of Wales brought the campaign to social media, sharing a cute childhood photo of herself using the hashtag Shaping Us. As a mother of three, Kate understands personally the importance of the effort, but it's also tied to her past advocacy, specifically around the conversations of mental health for Why adults and children, most notably with the organization Heads Together, Heads Together with William and Harry, an initiative to change that conversation. We know that mental health is an issue for us all. Children and parents, young and old, men and women, of all backgrounds and of all circumstances. Sparking conversations in support of World Mental Health Day over the last several years alongside her husband, the Prince of Wales. I'd love to know, and pray maybe the listeners also would be interested as well, as knowing how do you as individuals look after your own mental health. And recently participating in Children's Mental Health Week, meeting with primary school students to discuss the importance of supporting children's mental well-being and their ability to connect with others. Anything. Connecting releases our emotions yeah. to your, your other people that you care about. Absolutely. And it helps you feel part of things, doesn't it? Makes you feel like you've got relationships and people in your life that matter. The future queen is making strides all on her own. Last year, we saw her in Denmark for a rare overseas solo trip with the Royal Foundation Center for Early Childhood, the organization she founded, and the force behind this new initiative. 
And now Kate is hoping to do for early childhood education what she, William and Harry did for mental health with Heads Together, making the campaign a household name across the country. Now starting to do this new campaign, what the palace says could be known as her life's work. Molly Hunter, NBC News, London. Kate's promising more to come, so let's dive a little deeper into the princess's impact and influence. For that, we turn to royal commentator Katie Nichol. Hi, Katie. Hello, Q. So we've seen Kate change, haven't we, over the years? She wasn't always Princess of Wales, and no. she wasn't always, I suppose you could say, so confident. She wasn't always the Princess of Wales, but if anyone was born to do a royal job, it was Kate Middleton. I mean, she has been absolutely flawless, these sort of two decades of service, you know, before she even married into the royal family, quietly, and no one knew she was actually carrying out work at hospices to go and visit sick children. So I think there's always been a philanthropic vein to her. She's always recognised that sort of power of this spotlight that she would one day have. And I think part of the reason that she took her time, because she didn't rush into anything, and why she selected just a, you know, just a few charities was so that she could really get into them and really make a difference. So I think there is more confidence um, that there's a real vision about where she's going to go and the Princess of Wales that she's going to be because it was such a big role for her to step into. If you think Princess about Diana. it, right? If you think about it, you would want to make that your own. And Amazing. so she's worked really hard at that. Amazing, isn't it, to see somebody not born into royalty pull it off so well. Yeah, it's, it's extraordinary. And I think, you know, you have to look to her own family for the credit. Solid family. Absolutely. Carol Middleton, Mike Middleton. I mean, even before they were engaged, Kate made it really clear that if this was going to go the whole mile and it was going to end up with a royal wedding, which of course it did, her family had to be a part of it because I think they've always anchored her. They've always been such a fundamental part of her life. And I think when you look at, at Catherine as the woman she is now, the Princess of Wales she is, the mum that she is, that is all such a success, largely because of that sort of anchor which is the Middleton family, and they're far more involved than I think people realise. And she looks incredible, doesn't she? Does that count? Does that matter? Listen, of course she looks amazing <laughs> and she wears clothes fabulously and, you know, she rocks McQueen, but I have to say I'm really pleased that we're here talking about her work and talking about something other than her wardrobe. Yes, she's got an amazing wardrobe, but this work that she's doing with the early years, this legacy project that's going to define the rest of her life is far more important, but I did like that red Alexander McQueen. <laughs> she, I'm not going to lie. She doesn't speak too often when she does it's planned like this campaign yes do you think that's part of her her success well, i think most people don't realize that she's actually a very shy person she is shy because you've met her i've met her and when you do she meet is. her in private she, she is a little shy. she takes a little bit of warming up but yeah. once you get chatting to her she's got a great sense of humor um, and she's got a brilliant memory but i think when it comes to standing up and doing that sort of public speaking that is not something that comes naturally to her now if you look at the duchess of sussex for example she will get up in front of a lectern she will deliver without yeah, notes. She's, she's a that. brilliant orator. Yes. Kate, it's taken more work. It doesn't come as naturally. You know, she's had voice coaching. She's done a lot of practice behind the scenes. But I think you will have noticed as well, even at the recent speech she gave at BAFTA, there was that sense of relief at the end. There's still a little bit of a nervousness about it. That's no bad thing because I also make, I think that also makes her very real and very relatable because other people have problems doing that. But she's, she's mastered it and she's doing very, very well. Do you think she could be described as potentially the person who might save the royal family? Family. I think it's very, very fair and accurate to say that the future of the monarchy, the future of the success of the House of Windsor, rests very heavily on William and Catherine's King shoulders. And queen of the future. They are the future of the monarchy, yeah. and you know, behind every great man is a great woman, <laughs> and Catherine absolutely backs that up. It's been a bumpy last few months, last few years, honestly. I think the last it? couple of years have been tough. Ever yeah. since Harry and Meghan left, it shook up that whole concept of the Fab Four. William was left without his wingman. You know, Kate had a really close relationship with Harry. So I think behind the scenes, it's been very, very tough. But, you know, I'm told they haven't read Spare, they haven't watched the Netflix docuseries, they just want to rise above the drama. The one thing that I remember being told by someone very close to Kate, Kate doesn't do drama. And I think that is what we're seeing. We're not seeing them engage, we're not seeing them respond, they're rising above it. And for her particularly, she's using that spotlight as the Princess of Wales, that she's made her own. And I think that is fundamental to her success as to who she is today and she's doing it, she's yeah. rocking it. Perfect, Katie Nichol, expert on Kate, Princess of Wales, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, that was great. And coming up, more on the Princess of Wales as a mom, parenting the littlest royals, especially when the naughty moments are caught in public. Remember Prince Louis at last year's Jubilee? 
We relive it all after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Royal Rundown. Our in-depth look at Kate, Princess of Wales, continues. She is the future wife of the heir to the throne, William. But she has also welcomed three children into the world. And those kids... <laughs> every step of the way. Take a look. With a royal wedding behind them and a couple of years of marriage under their belts, Prince William and Kate Middleton were ready for their next adventure, parenthood. Each royal baby had the world awaiting in anticipation and cheering with excitement. Prince William and Kate Middleton's three children have been fixtures in the public eye from the time they were born and have become stars in their own right with a few tantrums and some adorable royal waves along the way. The couple was delighted to welcome their first bundle of joy and heir to the throne, George Alexander Louis in 2013. He's got a good pair of lungs on him, that's for sure. Uh, he's, uh, he's a big boy, he's quite heavy. Very emotional, it's such a special time. I think any, any parents, I think, probably sort of um, know what this feeling feels like. So Very special. Really Right from the start of Kate's first pregnancy, people were totally invested in their children. So by the time Prince George arrived, people were crazy for them. A little over a year later, Prince George was already embarking on his first royal tour, a visit to New Zealand and Australia. Cameras followed his every move, playtime with fellow toddlers, and a trip to Australia's Tarangar Zoo, where he took delight in some things not in others. <laughs> and just a few years later, he was off on his first day of school. The next addition to the family, a baby girl, arrived in 2015. At Princess Charlotte's christening later that year, big brother George was right by her side. The brother and sister have stayed side by side through a number of royal journeys. Through bad times and good. I think the fact that William and Kate have involved the children in some engagements and in these tours really says a lot about how they operate as a family. They want to stay together. William and Kate are very strong as a unit. They want to spend the time with the children. The two have even become regulars on the royal wedding circuit. The family became a party of five with the birth of another little prince in 2018. A very official grown-up name, Louis Arthur Charles. George and Charlotte couldn't wait to meet their new baby brother. In the years since, the family has offered a glimpse into their lives, celebrating milestones and more. The royal children have also stepped up, cheering on essential workers. We've even heard their voices for the first time. Hello, David Attenborough. What animal do you think will become extinct next? I like fathers. Do you like fathers too? What animal do you like? I think I like monkeys best. And saw them make their red carpet debut 
to attend a special holiday performance. Prince Louis has shown us his cheeky personality, most notably alongside his great-grandmother, the late Queen Elizabeth, at the Platinum Jubilee celebrations. The young prince's headline-making reactions from the balcony of Buckingham Palace delighted royal watchers, while his antics proved that all parents can fall subject to the whims of their children, the Prince and Princess of Wales being no exception. How do you manage toddler tantrums in your household? <laughs> Especially with multiple children. Yes, that's a hard one. I'd also like to ask the experts myself. Meanwhile, Princess Charlotte appears to be swiftly growing into her royal duties, perfecting the royal wave and schooling her brother on proper etiquette. And Prince George continues to rise to the occasion, joining his parents front and centre at sporting events and family festivities alike. These young royals have grown up before our very eyes. I think the question of what the future holds for the young royals is a very big one. No one really knows how the British monarchy is going to look by the time that Prince George accedes to the throne. I think it's fair to say, though, that all of these young children will grow up to pursue their own interests and have careers of their own before they become full-time working royals. Only time will tell what is next. But there's no doubt, we'll all be watching. And I'm sure we'll see more mom moments in the years ahead. The royal family, eh? They're just like us. Coming up, who was Catherine Middleton before she was Princess of Wales? We take the tiara off and look at the girl from an ordinary English town called Reading. Coming up next on The Royal Rundown. Stay with us. Welcome back. Prince William grew up in the public eye, but Kate Middleton was a commoner before global campaigns, royal weddings and babies. William and Kate started out as friends, with some twists and turns on the way to the throne. It's a love story that's captivated people all over the globe. Prince William and Kate Middleton. He's the boy who the world watched grow up. She's the girl next door who captured his heart, then a nation's. A royal couple for the modern age. But how did they get here? Well, looking back is half the fun. <laughs> William Arthur Philip Louis, the first born of Princess Diana and Prince Charles. He was raised as a royal had never been before in front of the camera. From cries to crawls, 
to the little prince's first day of school, we saw it all. Far away from the spotlight, Catherine Elizabeth Middleton, also the oldest, was born in Reading, Berkshire, with a family life that was said to be idyllic. In a sense, the upbringings could not be more different. Kate, of course, had a normal upbringing with two parents who were very much in love, hard-working couple. William's upbringing was just very, very unusual from the moment he was born. He had the cameras flashing all around him. So many private moments played out publicly for Prince William, most notably the death of his beloved mother, Diana. He was just 15. The world looked on as his mother was laid to rest. I think what struck us most forcibly covering Diana's funeral was the way in which these two very young men uh, walked behind their mother's coffin with such dignity. You could actually see Prince William becoming a man at that moment in front of your very eyes. Four years later, William would eventually meet his future bride at the University of St Andrews. Prince William, how are you looking forward to your first term? Although understandably people are very critical of the British tabloids, on this occasion, proprietors and editors actually stuck by the agreement and allowed Prince William to have a private time at university. I think it would have been completely impossible for him to have created the relationship that he did with Kate being in the spotlight. I'm afraid the press just simply would never have allowed it. The two were just friends at first. Legend has it, Kate won William over after modelling in a charity fashion show. That was the point at which people thought, uh, yeah, he's off the market, he's found that. They tried to keep their relationship a secret, but in 2004, the couple were photographed on a family ski trip. Catherine Middleton. The two graduated a year later, both with honours. William began special military training, Kate went to work for her family business. Then came the breakup. In a sense, you needed the breakup in order for the eventual story to come good, especially when there were such extraordinary media attention on her. She carried herself beautifully. Finally, everyone could uh, breathe easy again. They'd got back together. And then the news everyone was waiting for. Nearly 10 years after first meeting, William proposed. It was very romantic and um, it's a very, very personal. The ring, Princess Diana's 18 carat sapphire and diamond stunner. It's my mother's engagement ring, so of course it's very special to me. It was my way of making sure that my mother didn't miss out on uh, today and the excitement and the, uh, the fact that we're going to spend the rest of our lives together. I think the engagement meant an enormous amount to everyone. The idea that Princess Diana's eldest son had found happiness was something that we all wanted, we all really needed in a sense. The beginning of a new chapter for the couple and the royal family. When we come back, Kate through the lens of a photographer who has had rare access to the Princess of Wales. He has captured some of her most iconic moments. You really need to see this. In fact, you've likely seen some of his stunning pictures. Stay with us.
Welcome back. Chris Jackson has witnessed many milestone moments with Kate from a unique vantage point behind the camera lens as Getty Images' royal photographer. He tells us what it was like to photograph her personally over the years. Take a look. What's so lovely about photographing the princess is she's very much not there to sort of react for the camera. She's very much there to crack on with the job in hand. Whoever she's talking to, whatever she's doing, she's focused on the job in hand. One of the first times I officially photographed the now Princess of Wales was when Prince William at the time got engaged to her and it was an official photo call at St. James's Palace. I think it was that point where everything changed. It was evident to me that she was going to be a huge success. She looked great on camera. She's very natural. The excitement continued from that point on into the wedding and then onwards. The royal wedding was absolutely incredible and I remember the build-up vividly. I was positioned outside the front of Westminster Abbey um, to catch those first moments of the royal couple. We had a technology team who put in an ethernet cable under the road that connected to my camera, which meant my images would be sent out to the world in a matter of, of seconds, which was incredible. There's a level of pressure, uh, especially when you've got a limited time frame to capture these moments. You know, images that live on for decades and even hundreds of years time, you have to capture them in, in mere moments. I'll never forget the, uh, the excitement in the build up to the birth of Prince George. We're camped out at the Lindo Wing, these nondescript wooden doors in Paddington where the baby was due to be born. And yeah, it was really exciting. So in those moments when the royal couple emerged with their new baby onto the steps of the Lindo Wing, flanked by uh, two policemen, it was just really one of those fantastic feel good moments that I'll never forget. After the birth of Prince George, of course, we had, we had Charlotte and then Louis. And I think, you know, the excitement never really wore off. Recently, we saw her enjoying the Platinum Jubilee with Prince Louis, which was lovely to see, you know, such genuine family interactions. For me, it's always nice to get these kind of candid family moments and, and something that people kind of recognise as, as genuine when we think about our own families and then you see that they are a normal family. She always gets stuck in. Uh, I think that's one of the things that you really realise when you photograph her over the years. From flying through the air in India in a maxi dress and wedges, uh, to, you know, playing hockey, uh, basketball, abseiling, I, I photographed her doing all these things. It really connects with the people she's talking to. Often she's with young people and, you know, a real spirit of enjoyment is something that really enables her to connect with people, even if they don't necessarily speak the same language. They could be children. She'll get down with children on a level. I photographed her recently arriving at a school in um, the Caribbean as a rainstorm had started. And she got out of the car, she was smiling. Uh, she ran into the school as this deluge kind of hit from above. That really encompasses, you know, her sense of fun. When things don't quite go to plan, uh, she's always smiling. And I think it's what makes her so fun and I suppose at times unexpected to photograph in a positive way. Of course, there is those more poignant moments. I took a photograph of the um, then Duchess of Cambridge at um, Prince Philip's funeral. It was a moment where the Duchess had just got into the car and she kind of um, was preparing to move away. It's one of those serendipitous moments that sort of created quite an impactful, but one of the more unexpected um, images, I think, but incredibly kind of poignant at the same time for what it represents. There's yeah, so much to look forward to um, for the, the Princess of Wales moving forward. She's obviously hugely passionate about her early years. Uh, work um, and I can only see uh, that going in a really positive direction from my point of view and of course we've got a huge amount of historic moments to look forward to with the coronation of King Charles and, and Queen Camilla. So much to look forward to this year, um, it's going to be busy, the future's bright. We hope you've enjoyed this look back at a woman who will be Queen one day. Over the next few months, wherever you are, California, Texas, Florida, we'll bring you a royal rundown of the big royal developments from here in England. The next month will be extra special. Do you love royals? Do you love Paris? We're combining both as we join King Charles and Queen Consort Camilla on their first state visit abroad to France. The royal rundown from Paris. Fantastique. For now though, thank you for joining me this half hour. I'm Keir Simmons. See you next time on Today All Day.
Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! We are so excited to get started with cooking and today food. But before we do, before we do that, we're just going to take one second and shout out our new executive yes. producer. Talia is in the house. We just want to say, hey, welcome Happy to today. Happy first day. It's her first day of school. Go, we're, Talia. We're so happy thrilled. you're here. She's here. You know who else we're so happy to have? Oh. If, well, she's not at the ranch hanging out yeah. with her family or filming <laughs> episodes of her hit Food Network show. Reed Drummond is busy coming up with easy and delicious meals for you and your family. Reed's the star of The Pioneer Woman and a best-selling author of seven cookbooks. Her latest is called The Pioneer Woman Cooks Super Easy. It's 120 shortcut recipes for dinners, desserts, and more. We've missed yes, you. Yes, we're so missed happy you guys. you're here. It is so, I just feel like I'm seeing old friends, and it's just so happy. I'm so happy to be here. Well, I love it. We, okay, first of all, we have to say congratulations. Yes. Your, your daughter got married. Oh, my gosh, How thank sweet. you. How I was know. that? It was so much fun. I mean, oh. it, it was. we did it on the ranch, which was a crazy idea. We <laughs> sort of built this huge tent out there, but it was fun. And the, the great thing is it was a lot of work, but the day of, we were just able to let the process happen and enjoy it. It wasn't stressful. Did you do any, did, you didn't do any cooking for it, did you? No. Good. You just no, relaxed. No, no, no. I, know. Sure. I was going to say, who does sure. rehire as the no, That's why I was able to relax and have fun. Yeah, right? And to so. watch your husband walk her down the aisle. Oh, we yes. know he's been recovering yeah. from an accident. It must yeah. have been special. It, it was wonderful. I mean, it was a blessing. We, it, that's my favorite picture of the two oh, of them. Um, he was a little stiff then. He's, he's doing much better. He's on his horse today, so everything's okay, great. Back We're on the horse. Very, very All right. All right. What are we going to do? Oh, my gosh. Okay. So now that Hoda has eaten a whole chocolate I know. cake you know today, what? Um, that is really good. <laughs> Why is everybody making fun of you? I don't, I don't appreciate that. I don't, thank you, Jen. If I think I you would have supported me. Out, it you. was really quiet, and then all of a sudden the cake was gone. And <laughs> <laughs> but you I, should see what she does to chips. Oh, I well, you know, <laughs> you know it's morning. It's happening again. <laughs> you have the rest of the day to work it off, right? Exactly. So will. after the cake, I thought it'd be great to make some vegetables. So I'm going to do a sheet pan gnocchi Yummy. dinner. And okay. what I love about it, my cookbook, really, I'm not afraid to use shortcut ingredients. So my favorite ingredient is this, is store-bought gnocchi. Oh. So and is this frozen or you just no, get it? No, it's actually shelf stable, believe oh. it or not. So you can uh, you just buy wait, it. Throw it in there? Wait, yeah. are you, is this a joke? <laughs> what you just did? Out. You just dumped everything on the sheet everything pan? Everything on the sheet I pan. I thought you had to boil All it. Oh, oh, no, 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 because we're going to roast it. Oh. So then What's I've got. That, pesto? Yes, pesto. <gasps> I'm going to mix it with olive oil. Oh. Did I'm trying not to get pesto, pesto on you, so I moved it away from your beautiful. Marie, can you buy the pesto or did you make that? No, bought the pesto. See, I like everything so far. She's speaking our language. Yeah, I mean, during the pandemic, you know, I, I mm -hmm. kind of burned out on cooking a little bit because there were Didn't so we many all? kids around. Is that it? Yeah, so they, that's it. Because pesto is so flavorful, it has garlic and, and you know, And do you need to oil the pan? Did you already oil it? You don't it? have to because there's oh. plenty of olive oil in the pesto mixture. So you basically, just mix it all around mix like it all that. Around, and then look how Wait. beautiful it looks. Oh my gosh, Jenna. we have to pull taste. it out of the oven. So I like to do a little balsamic. Do you want us to help oh, you? Yes, glaze. Yes, help me and grab some go. Parmesan shavings. So do you just, that? I love balsamic glaze. Yes. I do everything I do. on anything. And you know what? I used to make my own by just reducing balsamic mm. for yeah. hours and the house would smell like vinegar and my kids would be like, what, what is that doing? smell? This so, is kind of crispy. It's delicious, isn't it? And see how all the oh veggies got beautiful color. Mm. Mm. But it's such We're, an easy meal and I would totally just eat this, but. Wait. We could do this, too, which is huge. Look at what we just in did. In one second. Put it in the oven, is dress it. Is this basil? It. What did you, what I is that? Tore basil. Oh, tore basil. Just, yep. And I, I'm so lazy, I don't even want to chop basil anymore. You just chop it. By the way, I, I like it on exactly. there. Oh, the should we go around the back? Yeah, more? we have another recipe. Okay, okay right. Great. Honestly, so mm -hmm. sheet pans are kind of my thing. I okay. love them. They're, they're just, I, I get nervous if I don't have 20 ready to go at mm -hmm. all times. So this is a sheet pan salad, and I love this concept mm. because you basically roast any veggie you want, it's it's the squash time of year. Oh, so yes. this is a mixture of cubed butternut squash Yum. and delicata squash. I love delicata what squash. What is that? I'm obsessed what is it? with it. Me too. Do you ever so put it on it? toast? Oh, Wait. yeah. Mash, mash yes. it. Yes. What are you talking it's about? It's just so a squash. At, this is what it looks like. And oh, it's basically store? kind oh. of an heirloom type okay. of squash. But the great thing is you can eat the skin. It gets really tender. Ah. So butternut, it can be a little bit tough, Should not I do, very tasty. Yes. Some? 
drizzle and then we're salt gonna do pepper. another roasted vegetable situation salt and pepper Italian seasoning this is so brilliant this and then just so toss brilliant. but here's what's fun about what? it so roast it and it's like 450 25 30 minutes okay. and look how gorgeous so that's delicious on its own but I build a salad oh, out of this thank you so you make your own dressing too don't you well sometimes sometimes, sometimes I doctor up bottle dressing so but I'm using the roasted vegetables as a base for mm, a salad. That's delicious. Mm. Isn't it good? Yeah. Oh, and the dressing mm -mm. is tahini, mm. mustard, lemon juice, olive oil, honey. Okay. And then, isn't it pretty? 10 okay. plus. 10 plus plus. Pomegranate seeds. seeds. Yep. Mm. yep. Pistachios. Pistachios, pomegranates. Mm. So this I love is, pomegranates. It's pretty at Christmas. Mm -hmm. And then goat cheese, which Hoda Great. doesn't love. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Hoda well, likes it. It, it just doesn't love her. Yeah. Okay. There's a Thank lot of TMI so in much. this segment. <laughs> There's a lot about Hoda. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Thank you so much for these recipes. Head today.com slash food. And for Ree's new book, it has recipes just like this one. Head today.com slash shop. I predict a bestseller. Me too. Okay. And we're back with today's food. Thrilled to say good morning to our next guest. Finally, after all of those teases, the pioneer woman herself, <laughs> Reed Drummond, has made it all the way from her ranch in Oklahoma. Are you near Blake's Ranch in Oklahoma? Not so much. Not so much. But, you know, we're in the sta same state. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, you know, we, we know each other. When I was there marrying him and Gwen, I would have stopped by your ranch. Seriously. And next time. Or yes. your 25th wedding anniversary. I could have yeah, renewed yeah. your vows. <laughs> oh, well, Ree's also out with a brand new cookbook. It's called Super Easy. It features more than 100 mm. shortcut recipes, which we like the sound of that. Actually, lots of them going on in the ranch in Oklahoma. You look absolutely stunning. You've got oh, a daughter who just got married, right? Yes. Hard to believe. Yeah, and you're about to celebrate your 25th anniversary, and Carson's going to do your renew your vows for you. That, that's that's be hard lovely. to believe too. I know I'm only 29. I don't know how I can <laughs> get married. For you look 29. Years. What happened you to you? during COVID? All I did was eat and drink I and know. not work out. And well, listen, same. I I was wearing pandemic pants this time last year. I don't know if you remember, but. But uh, yeah, I just, you know, the wedding was a great inspiration and motivation. But then once I started kind of uh, exercising more and getting healthier, it felt so good yeah. that I just kept going. So I'm, I'm kind of glad I'm over that hump. And now it's about just maintaining and, and yeah. enjoying. Well, I don't so. know if these delicious recipes are going to be uh, on any maintenance, but they are really smell good. I'm speaking of my wellness journey, yes. let's eat some tots yes. Uh, yes. with cheese let's. all over them. So, yeah. It starts with chicken. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so, I'm going to make tachos. Now, do you know what tachos are, Carson? No. No idea. You need to know. So, <laughs> tachos are just like nachos, but they're made with tots. Oh, Yum. Gosh. So, I baked, I baked some tots with a little we cumin and chili We have the gang eating powder, already. Right. Cook some chicken, add some celery. So, these are buffalo chicken tachos. Yum. Celery, garlic, and green onions. Did you make up tachos or is that a thing? I never heard of tachos. It's kind of a thing, but it hasn't okay. swept the nation yet. Yeah, so it's I'm going now to. Will. I'm It'll kind of hoping. Uh, it'll but be trending by the end of the segment. You can put on nachos, you can put on tots okay. and call them tachos. So Love it. Then, of course, buffalo sauce, and then you just let oh. this simmer. Mm. I started Delicious. with raw no. chicken, but you can do rotisserie chicken to okay. make it easier. Yeah. Mm. So simmer that until it's luscious. Have you and changed saucy. what you cook now because of your sort of wellness journey? Is it? Is it? Put you no. on a different path? Or you <laughs> no. And, you know, the thing is, is I have I have teenage boys, college students, uh, 
lad. Right. A, mm-hmm. Ranchers. You know, yeah, cowboy. And so I have to make food that everybody loves. Right. And yeah. I don't, I'm not good when I deny myself, yeah. you know, whole Butter categories of food. So mm-hmm. I'm just kind of learning to eat. I like to say I, I eat a Rhode Island sized piece of cake instead of a Texas sized piece <laughs> right. of cake. That's the best way you get the flavors and the taste. How does that it's taste? Just, it's it's delicious. Really good. So Everything's good. good. So, yeah. good. so yeah. you, you pull the tots out of the oven. Mm-hmm. They're seasoned, so they're a little bit elevated. I mm-hmm. kind of push them into a pile. Yeah. Pepper jack cheese yeah. all over. I okay. mean, this this is what a little spice. All about right oh, here. right here, yeah. And then you spoon the saucy chicken all oh, yeah. over. Mm-hmm. And so you Ooh. can do ground beef that. and got some hit, you know right? black beans and do sort of. Is a the chicken mix. gonna because it's hot melt that cheese or are you putting this back in the no, oven? No, it's going back in the oven. Okay, yeah. I so because okay. okay. you want to melt the cheese like uh, nachos. So all the cheese you want melt mine. Oh, here we go. That's all the cheese. Yeah. Actually, Pepper jack cheese, the buffalo yep. sauce. Mm. It's, it's hearty. It's, it's got a kick, uh-huh. but oh jeez! Did you know redheads can tolerate uh, spicy food more than anybody really? else? Really? Is that true? Yeah. true? yeah. So this is good. Is that true? We love it. That's we'll delve good. into the genealogy Chicken. of that some other time. But, wow. but basically, you garnish with. Uh, Blue cheese, mm-hmm. and to make blue cheese dressing, I just take ranch dressing mm-hmm. and add blue cheese to it. Oh, oh and clever. It's Another very shortcut. easy. You can do bottled ranch or you can make your own, but Brilliant. nice little shortcut. Mm-hmm. So this is what, uh, this is why my teenage boys love me. Oh, I can see why. That is delicious. Hey, Carson. Really, yeah. really good. Hey, this is gone. I mean, just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wham. What happened? What is eating a whole bunt cake already. Oh, no, we have wow. not started the cake segment yet. <laughs> hey, take a breath. No one's missed these eating segments more than hosts. <laughs> so good. <laughs> Remember, Rhode Island, not Texas. <laughs> She's going state by state. <laughs> All right, well, that does bring us to our chocolate cake. Now, this is your secret recipe, right? Okay, yes. Yeah. So, confession, my, my top secret ingredient in my top secret cake is dark chocolate cake mix. Oh, okay. And what? listen, I had my house full of humans during the pandemic yeah. and large six, you know, six foot five humans yeah. and football players. And I had... I was making so much food that I was about to lose my religion. I mean, <laughs> every day I was just like, I can't do it anymore. So I'm not afraid to whip out the chocolate cake. I doctored it with, uh, you know, bittersweet chocolate chips just to make it a little bit more uh, rich. Wow. But the thing is, this is the secret. It's a box cake. Well, it's what, oh, yeah. Okay. But the thing is, I'm topping it with ganache, oh, which is Ooh. heavy cream wow. and good oh, well, quality go. chips. Yeah. That's okay. all, two ingredients. Yes. And then it turns into this Here. luscious. Ooh. And are these oh, inside, too, or is this like a topping this thing becomes, situation? So, well, you can just eat one if you like. So you just but, make, okay, yeah. So you made the, the we cake. We gotta go. Oh, we're out of time. Okay, yeah. I really want to understand this. And then drizzle. Drizzle. Uh, I do sprinkles on top, <laughs> but after Halloween, you can take Beautiful leftover cake. candy, chop oh, it up, and top. put it on top. So oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Happy plate. She's Wait a minute. The plate. Oh, yeah. Show it. Clean Literally. plate club. Clean plate club. Clean plate club. Clean plate club. Clean plate club. You left a hand. She's going to eat owls. And also, she's going to move in with you. And she's she's giggling. She's giggling a lot over there. Thank Congratulations you. on everything. Congrats. Love your show. Thank yes, you guys. The best. Thank you. Thank you. All right, of course, you can find all these recipes at today.com slash food and pick up a copy of Super Easy at today.com slash shop. This morning on Today Food, lasagna two ways with layers of pasta, meat sauce, and creamy cheese. Lasagna is one of the ultimate comfort foods. But get ready for something a little new this morning. Reed Drummond a.k.a. The Pioneer Woman, has created two recipes. They're going to become your favorites. Her latest book is called The Pioneer Woman Cooks the New Frontier. Wait, good morning. Hi, Savannah. It's good to see you. Now, I, I can't, you're doing something really different with lasagna, which is risky. Well, it's a little risky, but when you see these recipes, you will totally understand. I like to mash things up, and yep. you know, you don't want to make lasagna over and over and over. So we are going to make shrimp scampi lasagna roll-ups. I like it. Which mm-hmm. are as good as they sound. So okay. I cooked some shrimp in butter, onion, garlic, a little thyme, and... Um, Chopped it up. Okay. So I'm going to make a sort of a shrimpy, cheesy filling. And this is cream cheese, ricotta, egg, and Parmesan. I mean, what could, you, what could possibly go wrong? I know. So I mean, good. it's all right. Sign me up. Yes. So I'll let you stir this together. Okay. And I'm going to start on the white sauce. Um, my new cookbook has lots of fun recipes like this. Yeah, where, I like that it's different. Yeah, and buffalo chicken quesadillas, for instance. I have two teenage boys at home. Yeah. Um, my girls grew up and left me. 
<laughs> so, so mean. So you've got those brutes at home. So feed. rude of them. You still got Charlie the dog? Well, Charlie's not with us oh, anymore, but I have I have Walter. Okay. Oh, Walter. And I have a couple of other little bassets running around. Look so. at the whole crew over there. It's like, so oh my God. Could you ask that? But, it. Okay. Oh, no, it's okay. Charlie lives on in his books. Yes, and, he does. And, we read his book all the time. Oh, I love hearing that. Okay, so I, I stirred it. So that's all stirred together, and I am making just a beautiful white sauce, and okay. it's... I started with the roux, and it has cream and milk. Yes. And so you cook and cook and cook until and you're this trying is to thick. thicken it up, right? Thicken it up. Is that thick enough or not really? This looks great. Okay. This isn't quite there, but right. I have I have Magic some already television. finished. Yes. So I'm going to have you help me build a oh, roll up. Okay. So this is the filling you just stirred together. Mm -hmm. Take about a generous third a cup. Okay. And put it on the end of the... Oh, this has the... Okay, the whole thing is in here. Our yeah. shrimp, our everything. And these are cooked lasagna noodles. Mm -hmm. I cooked them about half the time mm -hmm. that the package says. Right. And then just roll it up. Yes, the name, lasagna oh roll-ups. They're so cute and pretty. What do they you think? They are so cute. Oh my Amazing. God. Are you dying? Oh, yeah, my goodness. Not. Between bisque and a lasagna. Oh. Uh, good oh. point. That's exactly what it is. Oh. And then I always put the seam side down. Yeah, of course, to make it look pretty. I poured the white sauce in the bottom of the dish. Oh. And then I'll let you pour and the then rest gonna, of it. Am I pouring over. or am I drizzling? No, pour. Okay, pour, pour that sucker. Get in there. Okay, yeah. Why not? Look at that creamy yummy. It is Isn't so that gorgeous. Good. Yes. And then top it with mozzarella. And you can see the finished dish right here with parsley on top. That doesn't look crazy difficult either. No, it's not. And my daughter who lives in Dallas now uh, saw my new cookbook and she said, when I come home, will you make me the shrimp oh. scampi lasagna roll-up? So I mean, why not? Look at it. It's okay. gorgeous. I want to taste that. So that's lasagna one way. And now the this shocked way, me. Lasagna soup. I mean, it's it's really earth shattering. Okay, it's, tell me, tell me. I'm gonna have a bite. It's beautiful. So started with ground beef, mm -hmm. sausage, uh, onion, oh. garlic, yeah. thyme, oregano, and I just cooked it, and then added. Mm. Oh my God! Just try that. Just take your Delayed time. Reaction. So good. <laughs> okay. Time. And just turned it into a really delicious uh, whole tomatoes, tomato paste, mm -hmm. uh, parsley, and you can see the whole tomatoes. I actually like to let them cook down a little bit. Yeah. And then break them up because oh. they're a little softer. Mm -hmm. Anytime I try to squeeze them with my hand, it winds up in my eye. Yeah. Or, <laughs> that's not fun. Or on my shirt, which is even worse. Even worse, exactly. <laughs> so you just kind of, you browned up the the uh, beef and then. Oh. Yes. Then you put in the drain the, the excess fat and then turn it into a beautiful soup. Mm -hmm. And then I cooked some broken up lasagna noodles. Oh. So this is that there. And down at the bottom. Mm. It's like a hug. In. It is. Oh, <laughs> so really wait, what about point. the cheese? Where's the cheese? Okay, so okay. once you simmer away the soup yes. and the noodles are perfect, I make this little ricotta dumpling mixture. Oh, wow. And all it is is ricotta, parmesan, salt, pepper, basil, and oh, parsley. Mm -hmm. Stir it together. Mm -hmm. mm. And then when you serve up the soup, you just put little dollops right in the middle. Oh and it's just, mm -hmm. if the soup is really piping hot, the yeah. ricotta dumpling Starts just kind melt. of melts Can I come it. over to your house, mm -hmm. Reed? Yes, Is this yes. what we make there? Because it sounds fab. <laughs> Bring your kids and uh, Lad will put them to work on the ranch. <laughs> yeah, I would love it. I love it. Thank you so much. We, how do you like Fantastic. the soup? It's oh, amazing. amazing. Which one do you like I love, better? The, I love the oh. soup. Yeah. It's crazy. We, we're torn. Can you I tell? I, I like one vote for soup and. Uh -huh. Well, you know what though, and then you get a piece Switzerland of shrimp on this yeah. one. That's the thing, oh. and all that shrimp scampi oh. flavor is in there. You really redesigned it. lasagna. Yeah. That's, that's next level. Yeah. My wife I, loves your shrimp. I get bored really easily, <laughs> so I, I have to have some fun in the kitchen. Thank Thanks you so you. much, Rhea. I know you're coming back for the fourth yes. hour. More food. You can find all of these recipes at today.com/food. And for more on Rhea's book, go to today.com/shop. You can buy it there. Thank you, honey.
Drummond is busier than ever. Not only is she a mom of four, she's a New York Times bestselling author. She has three million Instagram followers, and she's a star of the hugely popular Food Network show. It's called The Pioneer Woman. And somehow she's also managed to find time to put together a new cookbook called The Pioneer Woman Cooks the New Frontier, which features a couple of recipes that we're going to be making today. And she took all the photos for the book. Of course, she you does everything. Too? She did that too. My camera's a mess. My camera's sticky. <laughs> Food all over it. So she's got roast chicken for us. Look at this. Yes, I I'm so happy to cook we're, with you both. So I'm a big happy. fan of both of you. We so love thank you, you for having me. So I wait, can't cook. Yeah, me either. But wait, you're based in Oklahoma, and you just do your sh everything from your home. Is that pretty much? We we film the show at our guest lodge, so yeah. at least they don't have to trip over my teenager's laundry, <laughs> yeah. you know, dirty socks in our real I house. I was telling her that my daughter Christina is like. She is the most incredible woman. I her oh, voice puts me to sleep. I watch her. Her life is oh, idyllic. Yeah. My voice puts my husband to sleep too. <laughs> All right, so we're making chicken today. Yes, I just want to show you my favorite way to roast chicken. Okay. I, I'm wearing gloves just for the spatchcocking. Yeah. So do you know what spatchcocking no, a chicken is? No, no, so no. Spatchcocking. It's super no. easy. Basically, okay. you have to put on gloves, cut okay. the backbone out, which is just snip on either side. Okay. That's the unpleasant part. And splay part. it out. But then you splay it out, and the whole point is to kind of... <laughs> Oh. The whole point is right. to get it as flat as possible. You can use your palm and uh -huh. kind of push, mm -hmm. but that way a chicken that would normally take um, a lot longer to roast yes. just takes uh, really a fraction of the time. So then you wind up with uh, a beautiful roasted chicken. So what I like to do is make sort of an herb dressing, Ooh, and it's just uh, simple olive oil, mm -hmm. herbs, cut some baby gold potatoes in half and just toss them in the herb mixture. How long does this take you to make? You want to help me oh, and just sure, kind of sure. scatter them around and then you would brush the same mixture on the chicken. Now is this Good a job. greased pan or is this not? It doesn't have doesn't to be have because to be. the chicken has so much, so much uh, beautiful grease as it cooks. Okay. So just really about 30 minutes total. You start with a high heat and then lower it and then look what you wind up with. <laughs> wow. Halfway through I add cherry tomatoes mm. and zucchini and then put it back in and finish it up. And you have this beautiful roasted chicken, which I like to serve as roasted chicken, mm -hmm. but I also like leftover roasted Can chicken. Can we try this? Yes, of Maria, course. That's like your perfect meal, by the way. That's right, that have is. Have a yeah. chicken. I mean, oh. I like French fries, but yes. that, we're not having that. But I'm sorry, Maria. No. <laughs> I should have made no, we're fries. Not, we're not allowed to eat that. Mm. I think roasted chicken is the perfect mm. food. And that is yummy. It's good for weeknight family mm -hmm. meals. But Are you surprised at how your cooking, your passion, has turned into this incredible success? Well, you know, I think you nailed it. Just passion. If you if you are passionate about what you do, mm -hmm. it can you take you in directions you never thought you'd you'd go in. And that's um, I've had so much fun with Pioneer Woman because it started as mm -hmm. blogging. Mm -hmm. So come around. Oh, yeah. um, and I want to show you what you can do with the chicken okay. if you don't want to slice it up and right. serve it as roast chicken. So you can shred it, mm -hmm. which is my favorite thing in the world. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to make a beautiful chicken and wild rice soup. Soup? Oh, Onion, yum. celery, and carrots. Okay. And then I'm going to deglaze with some white wine, which okay. I love in any soup. It just adds mm. beautiful flavor. And it's okay. getting to be soup weather out there. It's, yeah, it's getting to be. Finally, did you have a hot summer here well, like we did? We had, we had a scorcher. <laughs> it seemed to go on forever. And then add some flour just to thicken it okay. up. And then you'll cook this for a bit. Do all and your then, kids cook? No. Oh, yes. <laughs> Sadly, no. My daughter Paige loves to cook and she's a great cook. The rest mm. of my kids love to eat. So, uh, welcome to my plight. But I love to cook and so it's, it's, uh, What's it's that? chicken stock. Chicken stock okay. and then water. Mm -hmm. And this is so easy is wild that? rice. It's, oh, I didn't know it was that color. Yeah, it's not the mix that you buy in a box, oh. it's real wild rice. Um, Minnesota has, has wild rice okay. that kind of comes from Minnesota. And then you basically cook it until the rice is done. And mm -hmm. look how beautiful it That's looks. That's gorgeous. Oh. And then you add the chicken in, obviously. Um, and I like to kind of cream a it up a little cream. bit. Yeah, you got I to. Mean, I mean, I can't think of many dishes that I make that aren't made better with a little cream. <laughs> exactly. So you can add a little or a lot and then let it simmer some more mm -hmm. with some aromatics, sage, and rosemary and thyme. Yes. And then I love to add Ooh. kale also to at the, the soup. To the soup, oh, yeah. At the end, is that kind of the kind last of at touch? the end? You yeah. just let it uh, simmer in the last few minutes. Tell us what this pasta situation yeah. is. Okay.
Okay, so again, what you can do with the leftover chicken yeah. is make a chicken spaghetti casserole. And it's, I think casseroles are just the ultimate comfort food. And mm. this has mushrooms and mm. a little bit of wine, mm. of course. So mm. if you can spatchcock a chicken, you can do anything in life. <laughs> you can spatch cock a chicken. We need a t-shirt that says that. <laughs> yeah. But really, you can make soup and casseroles, enchiladas. Ray, so. this was, these were all delicious, awesome meals. I mean, they seem easy enough, too. Very easy. Thank if you. it's not easy, I won't do it. Awesome. Oh, that's good. For these recipes, head to today.com slash food. And for more about Reese Cookbook, go to today.com slash shop. <laughs> Welcome back. We're back with Today Food. This morning's guest, you know her, you love her, Ree Drummond. She is known as the pioneer woman, and today she's showing us two easy recipes for a family feast. You've got a, a simple, easy pasta recipe. What are we cooking? Yes, so I am so into shortcut homemade ravioli. And what makes it shortcut is that I use wonton wrappers. So these are just in the store. And I made a little mixture of ricotta, parmesan, salt, pepper, lemon zest. Wow. And I just put a little, I mm. can't get too close to you guys, but put a little dollop in the middle of the wonton wrapper. And then I just take my clean finger mm -hmm. <laughs> and rub a little egg wash around the edge. Huh. And then take a second wonton wrapper and put it on top, line up the edges. And then you just want to press it together. Oops, I grabbed three. That's okay. It's, I'm doing this on the fly. And then just force all the air out. And honestly, if you can't make, make homemade pasta dough or you don't have time, this is such a great shortcut. I like that. And then you just can get an assembly line with your kids, make as many of these as you want, and then just drop them into salted water one by one. And look. All right, I love those. Little pieces of ravioli. Just Delicious. Fresh hey, and ready to go. Hey, Ree, can we, we only have a minute, but we want to get to that dessert that, what is it? Ice it's box, ice yeah. box cake. Oh yeah. Blackberry ice box cake. So the frozen pound cakes that we all know and love, I shave the top off, crumble it into crumbs, pour in butter, very easy. And then just put this on the stove top, toast the crumbs. Mm. And then the cake that's left, you slice the cake into three slices lengthwise. I already started a layer and it's, cake, a mixture of jam, blackberries, and lemon juice, Yum. and lemon zest. Yum. It's so fun to use a frozen pound cake because then you cut that whole well, step. Oh my gosh, uh, you know, doesn't even look hard to re, re, it looks delicious. Something Savannah so, I could make, we're happy. Yeah. All right. We you just layer it kind of like lasagna. All right. Cake, jam, cream. Re, and then you wind we up. love you, we love you. We can't wait for your book to come out. Thank you for cooking for us. Uh, you can check out Thank her you, recipes girl. at today.com slash food. So glad to be back with you right here on The Boost. We've got another heartwarming show for you, including the story behind a viral video you'll be thinking about all day long today. But 
Let's kick the show off with a dad proving you can teach an old dog new tricks. For many, the arc of aging follows a familiar curve. Eventually, hunger for new hobbies and hidden talents fades. Brian Skeen argues there's a cure for that. You kind of really were like a bored dad. Yep. Eight years ago, the Chicago area software engineer had never donned a pair of figure skates, let alone tried his hand at the sport. Snowboarding and martial arts were more his forte. The childlike fascination first sparked in his child, when then seven-year-old Nico returned from a party at an ice rink, riveted. I was just like, I want to do this. I, you know, I was at that age where I wanted to do ballet and Irish dance and everything. For weeks, Skeen watched Nico's lessons. On the side of the rink. Yep. Shivering on the sidelines like this, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but soon found boredom in the bleachers didn't sit well. So I was asked to sign Nico up for their next lesson. They discovered the adult lessons. So I'm like, well, I got to be here anyway. I'm going to take lessons. Turns out this bored dad had untapped talent. Was it harder than you thought? For me, it really wasn't. Really? Like I said, I picked up on it really quick. Just to get the feet together to pull up. Yeah, Skeen progressed to private lessons, mastering the waltz jump, the sow cow, and the sit spin. Skills far too complex for most beginners. That's great. There you go. There you go. As I found out. Yep. And the more you bend your knees, the more you can actually push. In 2017, Skeen joined a theater team. Then it was on to competing solo, skating at the bronze level in his age bracket. Today, this once bored dad, now in his 50s, is a two-time national silver medalist. His muse in awe. He's inspiring. I think he is. I think he's he could change some people's lives, which is really crazy because, like, that's my dad. Skeen sees his story as proof that hunger for new hobbies doesn't have to fade if you're bored enough to break free. Yep. For all the bored moms, dads, parents <laughs> out there, what would you tell them? You know, for me, it was just stepping out on the ice with my kid and trying this out a little bit. Try something, you know? You don't have to go through life bored. Try Hang to touch your, your toes. Maggie Vespa, NBC News, Woodridge, Illinois. From one dad to a group of them, meet a trio of fathers who leaned on each other and found strength to become Iron Men, all thanks to their children. We have these shared experiences and really listen to each other. These dads have learned to lean on one another. They met at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital and together completed the St. Jude Iron Man. We had each other's back, just like we have our children's back. They crossed the finish line in October. Family never fights alone. A 1.2 mile swim, 56 mile bike ride, and a 13.1 mile run. I knew nothing about triathlons. I had to remember how to swim, and I'm not talking about in the lazy river on a floaty with a beer in my hand. <laughs> That's not the That's Iron just, Man. That's not the Iron Man. Chris Frunze's first Ironman left him wanting more. After falling a few minutes short of completing the course solo, Chris asked his friends to join him in honor of their children. It was important for me to be there for Chris. My son didn't give up. He fights every day, so I better fight. Chris Corbett's son, Calvin, was nine when diagnosed and treated for rhabdomyosarcoma, a cancer of the soft tissue. We don't get chemo anymore. He'll be turning 14 next month. And there was a time you didn't think that there would be that birthday. Exactly. Yeah. Currently, he's doing well. At 15, Tim Sparrow's daughter, Sierra, had surgery and more to treat medulloblastoma. I remember <clears throat> getting up at 2 in the morning, just thinking like, oh my gosh, you know, my kid has brain cancer. She's in college now. Unfortunately, her cancer has come back. And how is she handling that? Obviously, it's tricky, you know, going in to get treatment and then taking the classes. For Chris Frunze, life was interrupted when acute lymphoblastic leukemia was discovered in his firstborn, Jackson. He was four when he was diagnosed. Two months later, he went into remission. And you're like, wow, this is great. 
That's good. Um, and that was in May of 2019. Uh, my other son, Bennett, he was being treated for an ear infection. Soon after, an unimaginable one-two punch about Bennett from doctors. They took him in for a CT scan and said, there's a mass at the base of his brain. 14 months into balancing that sobering news and treatment for both sons, Jackson then received a second diagnosis, acute myeloid leukemia. Bennett received multiple rounds of chemotherapy and radiation, often at the same time that Jackson was undergoing his bone marrow transplant therapies. Then on April 3rd, 2021, Bennett passed away. He was three. It's the most horrible thing a parent, father can go through. You will be running these Iron Man and someday perhaps with? With Jackson. I would love to when he turns 18. What a great goal. On race day, Jackson, eight and cancer free, also Calvin, greeted the dads who swam, ran, and pedal with purpose. Up next, a man who is not a parent, but millions online do call him dad. Craig Melvin shows us how he's using social media to put his own spin on fatherly advice. Lock those elbows out, please. Make sure you're all bracing your core through this movement. When 26-year-old fitness trainer Summer Clayton, who goes by the handle Your Proud Dad on TikTok, first started making how-to videos on social media, he couldn't have imagined that millions of people would one day be calling him dad. But that's exactly what's happened. It's really nice to meet you. How did the whole thing start? It started out in these funny videos. Um, from there, it kind of moved into something more altruistic. What's up? Prom is coming up, you guys. So I got to teach you how to tie a tie. After an initial run of how-to videos about hygiene, cooking, and life skills, Summer, who's not a parent in real life, decided to try something entirely new. What if he invited his viewers to enjoy a virtual meal while he played the part of the perfect dad? Anything new? What's one good thing that happened to you today? I'm taking the gumbo. I didn't hear you. You weren't loud enough. <laughs> How have you been? It's very much interaction with the other person on the other side of the screen, asking them how their day was, going through like a little virtual check-in. Look at us, huh? Best friends. The Dinner With Dad videos became an instant success. In each of his videos, he sets a plate of food in front of his own and invites viewers to join him for a wholesome dinner with dad. I love you. And I think I realized right away that uh, there were people who didn't have that sort of interaction from some of the comments that I would see. What would you see? You know, comments like, oh, can you adopt me? I wish you were my dad. My dad doesn't treat me this way. They made comparisons between what they saw in me versus the relationships they saw with their parents. Hey, good morning. And with more than three million followers, the messages and comments keep pouring in. Bree Roberts grew up without a father figure in her life, and she's now one of Summer's loyal followers. I feel like he literally almost looks at all of his followers as if they are his children, and he has our best interests in mind, and it's hard to find genuine people, especially on TikTok. How much of this void that you are filling comes from a void that you had in your life? The relationship I had with my dad, it, it was great at first when I was really, really young, and then somewhere in the middle, uh, it really broke down. See, my dad was more of the disciplinarian, and I think that drove a really big wedge. I felt, man, I, I don't really even want to be around my dad. And so for some years, it was this breakdown, and just I just wanted to separate. And I brought some for my dad. He's from New Orleans. Mom and dad are from Louisiana. So he's going to give it a try. Let's see. Let's see what you think. And although they've had their rocky patches, Summer has been working toward a sense of healing with his parents over the last few years. We were able to have a real frank and honest conversation about it, and they were able to realize some of the things that they did. And we're gonna bring you up, we're going to clothe you, feed you, uh, make sure you have a roof over your head, and that is raising a kid. But there's a lot of other stuff behind right. the scenes, like talking about hard things and make sure they have someone to lean on. And I have older adults who are 
uh, parents that are soon to be or who are currently parents who will say, man, uh, I, I want to start doing some of these things for my kids, which is really fulfilling to know that they see me that way and not as just some random guy talking to his phone or on the internet, you know, with two plates of food. I'm glad you mentioned the two plates of food because I watched some of these videos and I wondered what happens to the other plate of food? I eat it. I oh, you eat absolutely, both? I do. Mystery solved. Uh, yep. <laughs> We've got more stories for you coming up right after the break. Stay with us. We're back on the boost with the story of a truck driver who followed the road toward his dream, pursuing his passion for painting. For more than 50 hours a week, Tim Kelly is on the go. Just the way he likes it. I like moving around. I don't like being stuck in one place for long. So driving a truck keeps me moving. He's been moving for the last 20 years, hauling everything from toothpicks to tires for T-Force Freight. It's a really good, comfortable, blue collar life. But like the roads that wind through Maryland, Tim's trek to trucking was not a straight shot. Driving a truck the dream? No, the dream was to be an artist. After studying art in college, Tim got a degree in illustration, just as that skill was growing obsolete. Tim was never starving as an artist, but trucking offered a steadier income, while the view from his cab fueled his passion inside. I could paint what I wanted. I didn't have to do what somebody else is telling me to do. And that was tremendously freeing. Finally, he could paint for pleasure, not pay. While his trailers unloaded, Tim connects with his canvas. Today's subject matter is familiar, a blend of colors giving his routine life. You get into like a zen mode where you're locked into what you're doing and everything outside of you sort of turns off. That's really fun when you get in that zone. From portraits of beauty to a simple scene at breakfast, Tim's talent is unmistakable and it hasn't gone unnoticed. His preferred style is plein air, completed outdoors. In 2021, at one of the most prestigious plein air competitions in the U.S., Tim's entry, titled A Little Bit Louder Now, won Best in Show. What does it mean to you? I'm still buzzing on the endorphins, Peter. You know, we artists, we're not supposed to be, like, ultra competitive. Right. But I have to confess, I really wanted to win that event. By day's end, Tim is parked at Baltimore's famed Inner Harbor, that golden light, a gift. It seems like this is what energizes you. Why? When I'm in the flow of this, there's nothing better. A trucker on the road. I am a painter that drives a truck. That's who I am. But an artist at heart. Up next, an artist who travels across the country looking for artwork in unlikely places and turning them into something unique. Take a look. 
On the walls of fine art galleries in Santa Fe, Terrell Powell makes an honest living with art that sometimes blurs the line between whimsy and reality. But by night, his alter ego sets out on the hunt for really basic art, the kind that hangs in budget hotels. So, well, here's his words for what he does. I describe it as hilarious <laughs> because I'm totally enhancing artwork. It's like I know the prints cost 38 cents, and so they're going to get some of my enhancement. Here's his MO. He travels the country, scouring motels for the most mundane and mass-produced artwork, pulls it off the wall, and adds a flourish. I thought, if I, what kind of artist am I if I don't? Put a little spin on these. You were looking at these paintings. These paintings were looking at you. Yes. I could not help myself. I had to do it. His goal, to make his mark in every state, from Iowa to Louisiana to Arizona. And yes, getting caught a whole bunch along the way. Sometimes becoming friends with the hotel staff. Other times slapped with a hefty charge on his bill. So and full what, disclosure, what he thing? offered to come by our hotel to demonstrate his tactics. Aha, uh -huh. all right, there she is. But we opted to have him show us an example at his studio instead. But here's the thing, behind his brushstrokes, there hides quite the twist. All of a sudden, these mysterious art reworks had started popping up around the country. Howdy, howdy! Hey, howdy, hey, come howdy. on in. Well, they're getting noticed and getting sold. It, it looks like this has a price tag. Uh, and it sold just a couple days ago. Did it sell for full price? 3,000, yes. And while many remain undiscovered... The total number is classified, but <laughs> I will say there's at least 30 to 40 still in hotels. He says New England beware because his paintbrushes are ready to prowl again. Gotti Schwartz, NBC News, Santa Fe. Coming up, how one man found light in the darkness through photography. Stay tuned. So glad you're back here on The Boost. We turn now to a different art form, photography. See how this man stumbled into a passion project that lit up his life. Most everyone you talk to loves lighthouses. And why is that? It's hope on the horizon. It's that beacon that leads you through the storm. It's lovers watching it at night. It, there, it means so many things to so many different people. For photographer Dave Zapatka, lighthouses are a flashback to his childhood by the shore. I grew up listening to the sound of the Watch Hill Lighthouse in southern Rhode Island as a kid. And on foggy nights in the summertime, with the window open, I'd hear that growing up. I guess that sort of instilled this uh, innate love of lighthouses. Dave left Rhode Island and traveled the globe as a network TV cameraman, but every so often, 
he focused his attention skyward. Well, we got stars, that's a good thing. When digital cameras came along, he made an incredible discovery. With the right equipment and lighting, he could capture his subjects at night, beaming in a sea of stars. In history, we don't have pictures of lighthouses working at night. They don't exist because film couldn't do this. I think you have to love something to shoot as beautifully as you shoot. Because I don't think you can look at something like that if you don't feel it. Oh, I agree with that. And it's burning inside me. If you look up at a lighthouse and there are the lights streaming out from there, it almost looks like godlike because you've got the light, you've got the shadow from the structure of the lighthouse, and it's helicoptering. And you, you go, wow, that's beautiful. It's breathtaking. One picture followed another, and in his free time, Davis spent the last nine years documenting hundreds of lighthouses. Yeah, it's still way too early. Though his subjects remain steadfast. So these are the slick ones. Ah. Reaching them can be treacherous. Oop, that's slick. From crashing waves to slick rock scrambles. Yeah, I'm just stuck in a rock. To remote destinations. A little bit further out, then we get the reflection. But that perfect shot delivers a lifetime of perspective. So when you look up and it's the perfect moment, you see a million stars. Tell me what you see and feel in that moment. I'll just lay down and look up and the Milky Way is right above you. You see the entire sky. I am this big. I'm, the, I'm smaller than that because it is so vast. And most people can't see that. You have to get out where it's really, really dark to fully appreciate how vast the universe is and how infinitely small we are. It's so funny, kind of at the, at the end of your news career, you really found what rings your bell. There's a beauty in that that, I, that is more fulfilling to me because in TV, I shoot a story, it goes on the air, it's gone. Poof. Poof, gone. So now I have something tangible to hang on the wall that I never had in 30 years, 40 years of television. Portraits of our nation's seaside guardians, once a permanent fixture, but these beacons are slowly fading away. Now with climate change and with storms that are stronger, lighthouses are starting to be more imperiled. And then the Coast Guard with the new technology, GPS especially, right. are no longer needed. For me, it's trying to capture these before they disappear. Because remember, one time there were 1,600 lighthouses in the country. There's only a, a roughly around 800 left that are still operating. What do you hope your grandkids remember you for in, in, in this light? Oh, look at Grandpa did. He left us with something for the world to have. One man leaving the light on for generations to come. Now we are turning back the clock, going into our viral vault to explore a time before digital cameras. Al Roker brings us this story with only the use of still pictures. Take a look. Once upon a time, cameras had film and pictures had weight. But then came progress. In a flash, film was out and files were in until we remembered what was. I think people want to get back to something which I would call real. In that spirit, we capture my journey to analog with just two photographers and a handful of film cameras. This is Jeffrey Berliner. He heads up New York's Penumbra Foundation. Jeffrey, hi, Al Roker, how are you? Al, wonderful to meet you. This is a, a great place, what is this? We teach early photographic processes, everything devoted to photography, history of photography we do here. I understand you've got a, literally a treasure trove downstairs. Yes, I've been collecting early photographic equipment for the better part of 15 years. Let's go take a look. Sure. We're going into a basement here. Oh yeah, into the depths of photographic history. Look at this. This is the camera repair section. And back here, this is my office. A little, little messy. Oh my gosh. Look at these lenses. How many lenses do you have? I would probably have close to 2,000 lenses that represent the entire history of the photographic lens. Are you surprised that film is kind of staging a comeback? There was a point when I really thought it was gone. Some of it was gone. In 2008, 
Polaroid stopped producing instant film. The machines dismantled, cameras trashed. Until just recently, when another company had to reinvent the process. Now instant is everywhere, but it's nothing new. The tintype was considered the Polaroid in the 19th century. So people think these photographs took a long time to make. A tintype, which is how Abraham Lincoln was photographed, Civil War, could be made in the course of about 15 minutes. So we're going to take this here and we're going to pour it onto the plate. Chemicals poured on a sheet of metal make it light sensitive and ready for my close-up. Wow, that's strong. Okay, so now you have to stay perfectly still. Look directly into the lens. Ready, set. Bada bing, bada boom. I'm going to take Al into the darkroom to see the development process. Yeah. Wash off the developer. Very cool. Now, here's the fun part. We're going to put it into the fixer. This is where the magic happens. Oh, wow. I can see it changing. That's wild. It almost looks like it's from a different era. It is. We went back in time. We went back to 1862. What do you think? you like it? Wow. That's old school. That's old, old school. <laughs> to the future! Next, I headed to Lamography, a photography store devoted to everything analog. So, Catherine, we've seen the past and how people are kind of bringing that to life, but you're taking that one step further. Yeah, so what Lomography is doing is really trying to make film cameras accessible. It's a huge resurgence now. I think there's such intrinsic value in something you can touch and hold that are not living on hard drives and behind screens. There's just something about the way film renders light, and that's what people are really zeroing in on. This is the Lomo Instant Wide. Can I borrow this? Yeah, absolutely. All right. I'm going to go take some pictures. Hi, how are you? Can I take a picture of you and your dog? What's his name? Sandy. Sandy, hold on just a second. All right. Thank you, sir. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Can I take your picture? Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. With a few clicks, this day has been frozen in time and on film. And I've got a keepsake that can never be deleted. Coming up, the latest viral video that'll boost your day. we've got one more video that'll surely put a smile on your face. Check it out. So, here a dad comes home to find his kids have once again played the prank on him by stacking all those plastic cups at the entryway, but mom wants to make sure the kids get their money's worth, so she secretly tells dad to leave and come back in again when the kids are in the room. <laughs> Good day. Good day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Funny every time. Oh. Love it, love it. Well, we hope you were able to start your day off with a little positivity. So what do you say we do it all again tomorrow? We'll see you then with more of the boost on today all day.
Hello, and welcome to the Royal Rundown. This one is the best yet, which is not saying too much since it's only our second show. They just keep getting better and better. I'm Keir Simmons in front of Kensington Palace. Why are we here? Because Catherine, Princess of Wales, lived here until last summer. And drum roll, this episode is all about Kate. She just stepped into the spotlight to champion a cause that is close to her heart, making sure young children get a great start in life. Why did she choose to lead on this? Is she becoming more independent now? And aside from the future of our children, could the future of the whole royal family depend on her? Goodness me, we have questions. But there's no question there is more to Kate than this new important effort. Who is she as a mom? What will her legacy be? And how did she build her own family? We'll get into all that and more in the next half hour. But first, Molly Hunter with the latest on what the palace is calling Princess Kate's life's work. The Princess of Wales is stepping into the spotlight as she launches her biggest solo project yet. Introducing Shaping Us, a campaign to raise awareness for early childhood education. It is essential to not only understand the unique importance of our earliest years, but to know what we can all do to help raise future generations of happy, healthy adults. The new campaign officially launched back in early February. By focusing our collective time, energy and resources on these most preventative years, we can make a huge difference. And she kicked off the campaign solo on stage wearing a bright red suit, her husband, the Prince of Wales, in the audience at a glitzy star-studded event at BAFTA. Later, visiting the iconic Leeds Kirkgate Market that week, meeting with students in the Childhood Studies program at the University of Leeds. So nice to see you. And joining Thank radio you. host yeah, Roman yeah, Kemp really to share really the mission of the campaign. For yourself as a mother, was this something that you wanted to learn for you as, as well as like putting it out there? Yeah, absolutely. And the key things that I, you sort of, I've come away with and what I've learned the most is, mm. and which is what the science says really, is that the importance of having healthy and strong relationships in a child's life is really critical having a nurturing environment and having experiences in which a child can really understand and discover not only themselves but also the world in which they live. Mm. You know, these are the key things that we should really be focusing on. According to the Royal Foundation Centre for Early Childhood, only one in five people in the United Kingdom understand the importance of those first five years, where the brain develops more than at any other age. Shaping Us is heavily focused on the science and released this claymation film across the country. The Princess of Wales brought the campaign to social media, sharing a cute childhood photo of herself using the hashtag Shaping Us. As a mother of three, Kate understands personally the importance of the effort, but it's also tied to her past advocacy, specifically around the conversations of mental health for Why adults and children, most notably with the organization Heads Together with William and Harry, an initiative to change that conversation. We know that mental health is an issue for us all. Children and parents, young and old, men and women, of all backgrounds and of all circumstances. Sparking conversations in support of World Mental Health Day over the last several years alongside her husband, the Prince of Wales. I'd love to know, and pray maybe the listeners also would be interested as well, as knowing how do you as individuals look after your own mental health. And recently participating in Children's Mental Health Week, meeting with primary school students to discuss the importance of supporting children's mental well-being and their ability to connect with others. And you think. Connecting releases our emotions yeah. to your, your other people that you care about. Absolutely. And it helps you feel part of things, doesn't it? Makes you feel like you've got relationships and people in your life that matter. The future queen is making strides all on her own. Last year, we saw her in Denmark for a rare overseas solo trip with the Royal Foundation Center for Early Childhood, the organization she founded, and the force behind this new initiative. And now, Kate is hoping to do for early childhood education what she, William and Harry did for mental health with Heads Together, making the campaign a household name across the country. Now, starting to do this new campaign, what the palace says could be known as her life's work. Molly Hunter, NBC News, London. Kate's promising more to come, so let's dive a little deeper into the princess's impact and influence. For that, we turn to royal commentator Katie Nichol. Hi, Katie. Hello, Keir. So we've seen Kate 
change, haven't we, over the years? She wasn't always Princess of Wales, and no. she wasn't always, I suppose you could say, so confident. She wasn't always the Princess of Wales, but if anyone was born to do a royal job, it was Kate Middleton. I mean, she has been absolutely flawless, these sort of two decades of service, you know, before she even married into the royal family, quietly, and no one knew she was actually carrying out work at hospices to go and visit sick children. So I think there's always been a philanthropic vein to her. She's always recognised that sort of power of this spotlight that she would one day have. And I think part of the reason that she took her time, because she didn't rush into anything, and why she selected just a, you know, just a few charities was so that she could really get into them and really make a difference. So I think there is more confidence um, that there's a real vision about where she's going to go and the Princess of Wales that she's going to be because it was such a big role for her to step into. If you think Princess about Diana. it, right? If you think about it, you would want to make that your own. And Amazing. so she's worked really hard at that. Amazing, isn't it? To see somebody not born into royalty pull it off so well. Yeah, it's, it's extraordinary. And I think, you know, you have to look to her own family for the credit. Solid family. Absolutely. Carol Middleton, Mike Middleton. I mean, even before they were engaged, Kate made it really clear that if this was going to go the whole mile and it was going to end up with a royal wedding, which of course it did, her family had to be a part of it because I think they've always anchored her. They've always been such a fundamental part of her life. And I think when you look at, at Catherine as the woman she is now, the Princess of Wales she is, the mum that she is, that is all such a success, largely because of that sort of anchor which is the Middleton family, and they're far more involved than I think people realise. And she looks incredible, doesn't she? Does that count? Does that matter? Listen, of course she looks amazing <laughs> and she wears clothes fabulously and, you know, she rocks McQueen, but I have to say I'm really pleased that we're here talking about her work and talking about something other than her wardrobe. Yes, she's got an amazing wardrobe, but this work that she's doing with the early years, this legacy project that's going to define the rest of her life is far more important, but I did like that red Alexander McQueen. <laughs> she, I'm not going to lie. She doesn't speak too often when she does it's planned like this campaign yes do you think that's part of her her success well, i think most people don't realize that she's actually a very shy person she is shy because you've met her i've met her and when you do she meet is. her in private she, she is a little shy. she takes a little bit of warming up but yeah. once you get chatting to her she's got a great sense of humor um, and she's got a brilliant memory but i think when it comes to standing up and doing that sort of public speaking that is not something that comes naturally to her now if you look at the duchess of sussex for example she will get up in front of a lectern she will deliver without yeah, notes. She's, she's a brilliant orator. Yes. Kate, it's taken more work. It doesn't come as naturally. You know, she's had voice coaching. She's done a lot of practice behind the scenes. But I think you will have noticed as well, even at the recent speech she gave at BAFTA, there was that sense of relief at the end. There's still a little bit of a nervousness about it. That's no bad thing because I also make, I think that also makes her very real and very relatable because other people have problems doing that. But she's, she's mastered it and she's doing very, very well. Do you think she could be described as potentially the person who might save the royal family? Family. I think it's very, very fair and accurate to say that the future of the monarchy, the future of the success of the House of Windsor, rests very heavily on William and Catherine's King shoulders. And queen of the future. They are the future of the monarchy, yeah. and you know, behind every great man is a great woman, <laughs> and Catherine absolutely backs that up. It's been a bumpy last few months, last few years, honestly. I think the last it? couple of years have been tough. Ever yeah. since Harry and Meghan left, it shook up that whole concept of the Fab Four. William was left without his wingman. You know, Kate had a really close relationship with Harry. So I think behind the scenes, it's been very, very tough. But, you know, I'm told they haven't read Spare, they haven't watched the Netflix docuseries, they just want to rise above the drama. The one thing that I remember being told by someone very close to Kate, Kate doesn't do drama. And I think that is what we're seeing. We're not seeing them engage, we're not seeing them respond, they're rising above it. And for her particularly, she's using that spotlight as the Princess of Wales, that she's made her own. And I think that is fundamental to her success as to who she is today and she's doing it, she's yeah. rocking it. Perfect, Katie Nichol, expert on Kate, Princess of Wales, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, that was great. And coming up, more on the Princess of Wales as a mom, parenting the littlest royals, especially when the naughty moments are caught in public. Remember Prince Louis at last year's Jubilee? We relive it all after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Royal Rundown. Our in-depth look at Kate, Princess of Wales continues. She is the future wife of the heir to the throne, William, but she has also welcomed three children into the world, and those kids...
attention every step of the way. Take a look. With a royal wedding behind them and a couple of years of marriage under their belts, Prince William and Kate Middleton were ready for their next adventure, parenthood. Each royal baby had the world awaiting in anticipation and cheering with excitement. Prince William and Kate Middleton's three children have been fixtures in the public eye from the time they were born and have become stars in their own right, with a few tantrums and some adorable royal waves along the way. The couple was delighted to welcome their first bundle of joy and heir to the throne, George Alexander Louis in 2013. He's got a good pair of lungs on him, that's for sure. Uh, he's, uh, he's a big boy, he's quite heavy. Very emotional, it's such a special time. I think any, any parent, I think, probably sort of um, know what this feeling feels like. So Very special. Right from the start of Kate's first pregnancy, people were totally invested in their children. So by the time Prince George arrived, people were crazy for them. A little over a year later, Prince George was already embarking on his first royal tour, a visit to New Zealand and Australia. Cameras followed his every move, playtime with fellow toddlers, and a trip to Australia's Tarangar Zoo, where he took delight in some things, not in others. <laughs> and just a few years later, he was off on his first day of school. The next addition to the family, a baby girl, arrived in 2015. At Princess Charlotte's christening later that year, Big Brother George was right by her side. The brother and sister have stayed side by side through a number of royal journeys, through bad times and good. I think the fact that William and Kate have involved the children in some engagements and in these tours really says a lot about how they operate as a family. They want to stay together. William and Kate are very strong as a unit. They want to spend the time with the children. The two have even become regulars on the royal wedding circuit. The family became a party of five with the birth of another little prince in 2018. A very official grown-up name, Louis Arthur Charles. George and Charlotte couldn't wait to meet their new baby brother. In the years since, the family has offered a glimpse into their lives, celebrating milestones and more. The royal children have also stepped up, cheering on essential workers. We've even heard their voices for the first time. Hello, David Attenborough. What animal do you think will become extinct next? I like bunnies. Do you like bunnies too? What animal do you like? I think I like monkeys best. And saw them make their red carpet debut to attend a special holiday performance. Prince Louis has shown us his cheeky personality, most notably alongside his great-grandmother, the late Queen Elizabeth, at the Platinum Jubilee celebrations. The young prince's headline-making reactions from the balcony of Buckingham Palace delighted royal watchers, while his antics proved that all parents can fall subject to the whims of their children, the Prince and Princess of Wales being no exception. How do you manage toddler tantrums in your household? <laughs> Especially with multiple children. Yes, that's a hard one. I'd also like to ask the experts myself. Meanwhile, Princess Charlotte appears to be swiftly growing into her royal duties, perfecting the royal wave and schooling her brother on proper etiquette. And Prince George continues to rise to the occasion, joining his parents front and centre at sporting events and family festivities alike. These young royals have grown up before our very eyes. I think the question of what the future holds for the young royals is a very big one. No one really knows how the British monarchy is going to look by the time that Prince George accedes to the throne. I think it's fair to say, though, that all of these young children will grow up to pursue their own interests and have careers of their own before they become full-time working royals. Only time will tell what is next but there's no doubt we'll all be watching. And I'm sure we'll see more mom moments in the years ahead. The royal family, eh? They're just like us. Coming up, who was Catherine Middleton before she was Princess of Wales? We take the tiara off and look at the girl from an ordinary English town 
Cooled Ready, coming up next on the Royal Rundown. Stay with us. Welcome back. Prince William grew up in the public eye, but Kate Middleton was a commoner before global campaigns, royal weddings and babies. William and Kate started out as friends, with some twists and turns on the way to the throne. It's a love story that's captivated people all over the globe. Prince William and Kate Middleton. He's the boy who the world watched grow up. She's the girl next door who captured his heart, then a nation's. A royal couple for the modern age. But how did they get here? Well, looking back is half the fun. <laughs> William Arthur Philip Louis, the first born of Princess Diana and Prince Charles. He was raised as a royal had never been before in front of the camera. From cries to crawls to the little prince's first day of school, we saw it all. Far away from the spotlight, Catherine Elizabeth Middleton, also the oldest, was born in Reading, Berkshire, with a family life that was said to be idyllic. In a sense, the upbringings could not be more different. Kate, of course, had a normal upbringing with two parents who were very much in love, hard-working couple. William's upbringing was just very, very unusual from the moment he was born. He had the cameras flashing all around him. So many private moments played out publicly for Prince William, most notably the death of his beloved mother, Diana. He was just 15. The world looked on as his mother was laid to rest. I think what struck us most forcibly covering Diana's funeral was the way in which these two very young men uh, walked behind their mother's coffin with such dignity. You could actually see Prince William becoming a man at that moment in front of your very eyes. Four years later, William would eventually meet his future bride at the University of St Andrews. Prince William, how are you looking forward to your first term? Although understandably people are very critical of the British tabloids, on this occasion, proprietors and editors actually stuck by the agreement and allowed Prince William to have a private time at university. I think it would have been completely impossible for him to have created the relationship that he did with Kate being in the spotlight. I'm afraid the press just simply would never have allowed it. The two were just friends at first. Legend has it, Kate won William over after modelling in a charity fashion show. 
That was the point at which people thought, uh, yeah, he's off the market. He's found that. They tried to keep their relationship a secret, but in 2004, the couple were photographed on a family ski trip. Catherine Middleton. The two graduated a year later, both with honours. William began special military training. Kate went to work for her family business. Then came the breakup. In a sense, you needed the breakup in order for the eventual story to come good, especially when there were such extraordinary media attention on her. She carried herself beautifully. Finally, everyone could uh, breathe easy again. They'd got back together. And then the news everyone was waiting for. Nearly 10 years after first meeting, William proposed. It was very romantic and um, it's a very, very personal. The ring, Princess Diana's 18 karat sapphire and diamond stunner. It's my mother's engagement ring, so of course it's very special to me. It was my way of making sure that my mother didn't miss out on uh, today and the excitement and the, uh, the fact that we're going to spend the rest of our lives together. I think the engagement meant an enormous amount to everyone. The idea that Princess Diana's eldest son had found happiness was something that we all wanted, we all really needed in a sense. The beginning of a new chapter for the couple and the royal family. When we come back, Kate through the lens of a photographer who has had rare access to the Princess of Wales. He has captured some of her most iconic moments. You really need to see this. In fact, you've likely seen some of his stunning pictures. Stay with us. back, Chris Jackson has witnessed many milestone moments with Kate from a unique vantage point behind the camera lens as Getty Images royal photographer. He tells us what it was like to photograph her personally over the years. Take a look. What's so lovely about photographing the princess is she's very much not there to sort of react for the camera. She's very much there to crack on with the job in hand. Whoever she's talking to, whatever she's doing, she's focused on the job in hand. One of the first times I officially photographed the now Princess of Wales was when Prince William at the time got engaged to her and it was an official photo call at St. James's Palace. I think it was that point where everything changed. It was evident to me that she was going to be a huge success. She looked great on camera. She's very natural. The excitement continued from that point on into the wedding and then onwards. The Royal Wedding was absolutely incredible and I remember the build-up vividly. I was positioned outside the front of Westminster Abbey um, to catch those first moments of the Royal Couple. We had a technology team who put in an Ethernet cable under the road that connected to my camera, which meant my images would be sent out to the world in a matter of, of seconds, which was incredible. There's a level of pressure, uh, especially when you've got a limited time frame to capture these moments. You know, images that live on for decades and even hundreds of years' time, you have to capture them in, in mere moments. 
And I'll never forget the uh, the excitement in the build up to the birth of Prince George. We're camped out at the Lindo Wing, these nondescript wooden doors in Paddington, where the baby was due to be born. And yeah, it was really exciting. So in those moments when the royal couple emerged with their new baby onto the steps of the Lindo Wing, flanked by uh, two policemen, it was just really one of those fantastic feel-good moments that I'll never forget. After the birth of Prince George, of course, we had we had Charlotte and then Louis, and I think you know the excitement never really wore off. Recently, we saw her enjoying the Platinum Jubilee with Prince Louis, which was lovely to see, you know, such genuine family interactions. For me, it's always nice to get these kind of candid family moments and, and something that people kind of recognise as, as genuine when we think about our own families and then you see that they are a normal family. She always gets stuck in. Uh, I think that's one of the things that you really realise when you photograph her over the years. From flying through the air in India in a maxi dress and wedges, uh, to, you know, playing hockey, uh, basketball, abseiling, I, I photograph her doing all these things. It really connects with the people she's talking to. Often she's with young people and you know, a real spirit of enjoyment is something that really enables her to connect with people, even if they don't necessarily speak the same language. They could be children. She'll get down with children on a level. I photographed her recently arriving at a school in um, the Caribbean as a rainstorm had started. And she got out of the car, she was smiling. Uh, she ran into the school as this deluge kind of hit from above. That really encompasses, you know, her sense of fun. When things don't quite go to plan, uh, she's always smiling. And I think it's what makes her so fun and I suppose at times unexpected to photograph in a positive way. Of course, there is a, those more, more poignant moments. I took a photograph of the um, then Duchess of Cambridge at um, Prince Philip's funeral. It was a moment where the, the Duchess had just got into the car and she kind of um, was preparing to move away. It's one of those serendipitous moments that sort of created quite an impactful, but one of the more un unexpected um, images, I think, but incredibly kind of poignant at the same time for what it represents. Yeah, so much to look forward to um, for the, the Princess of Wales moving forward. She's obviously hugely passionate about her early years uh, work, um, and I can only see uh, that going in a really positive direction from my point of view. And of course, we've got a huge amount of historic moments to look forward to with the coronation of King Charles and, and Queen Camilla. So much to look forward to this year. Um, it's going to be busy. The future's bright. We hope you've enjoyed this look back at a woman who will be queen one day. Over the next few months, wherever you are, California, Texas, Florida, we'll bring you a royal rundown of the big royal developments from here in England. And next month will be extra special. Do you love royals? Do you love Paris? We're combining both as we join King Charles and Queen Consort Camilla on their first state visit abroad to France. The Royal Rundown from Paris. Fantastic. For now, though, thank you for joining me this half hour. I'm Keir Simmons. See you next time on Today All Day. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Yeah. We are so excited to get started with cooking and today food. But before we do, before we do that, we're just going to take one second and shout out our new executive yes, producer. Talia is in the house. We just want to say, hey, welcome Happy to today. Happy first day. It's her first day of school. Go, Talia. We're so happy happy you're here. here. She's here. You know who else we're so happy to have? Oh. Well, she's not at the ranch hanging out yeah. with her family or filming <laughs> episodes of her hit Food Network show. Reed Drummond is busy coming up with easy and delicious meals for you and your family. Reed's the star of The Pioneer Woman and a best-selling author of seven cookbooks. Her latest is called The Pioneer Woman Cooks Super Easy. It's 120 shortcut recipes for dinners, desserts, and more. We've missed yes, you. Oh, we're so missed happy you guys. you're here. It is so, I just feel like I'm seeing old friends and it's just so happy. I'm so happy to be here. Well, I love it. We, okay, first of all, we have to say congratulations. Yes. Your, your daughter got married. Oh my gosh, How thank sweet. you. How I was know. that? It was so much fun. I mean, oh. it, it was, we did it on the ranch, which was a crazy idea. We <sighs> sort of built this huge tent out there, but it was fun. And the, the great thing is it was a lot of work, but the day of, we were just able to 
let the process happen and enjoy it. It wasn't stressful. Did you do any? Did, you didn't do any cooking for it, did you? No. Good. You just no, relaxed. No, no, no. Sure. I know. I was going to say, who does sure. rehire as the yeah. That's why I was able to relax and have fun. Yeah. And right? to so. watch your husband walk her down the aisle. Oh, we yes. know he's been recovering yeah. from an accident. It must yeah. have been special. It, it was wonderful. I mean, it was a blessing. We, it, that's my favorite picture of the two of them. Um, he was a little stiff then. He's, he's doing much better. He's on his horse today, so everything is okay, great. Back We're on the horse. Very, very lucky. All right. All right. What are we so, going to yes, do? Oh, my gosh. Away. Okay, so now that Hoda has eaten a whole chocolate I know. cake you know today. I know um, really good. Why is everybody making fun of you? Oh, I don't appreciate that. I don't, thank you, Jen. If I think I you would have supported me. Up, it you. was really quiet, and then all of a sudden, the cake was gone. And <laughs> <laughs> But you I, should see what she does to chips. Oh, I will. You know, <laughs> you know it's morning. It's happening again. You have the rest of the day to work it off, right? Exactly. So will. after the cake, I thought it would be great to make some vegetables. So I'm going to do a sheet pan gnocchi Yummy. dinner. And okay. what I love about it, my cookbook, really, I'm not afraid to use shortcut ingredients. So my favorite ingredient is this is store-bought gnocchi. Oh. So and is this frozen or you just no, get it? No, it's actually shelf stable, believe oh. it or not. So you can uh, you just buy wait, it. Throw it in there? Wait, yeah. are you, is this a joke? <laughs> what you just did? Gnocchi. You just dumped everything on the sheet everything pan? Everything on the sheet I pan. I thought you had to boil oh, it. Oh, oh, no, 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 because we're going to roast it. Oh. So then What's I've that, got. Pesto? Yes, pesto. <gasps> I'm going to mix it with olive oil. Oh. I'm trying not to get pesto too? on you, so I moved it away from your beautiful. Marie, can you buy the pesto or did you make that? No, bought the pesto. See, I like everything so far. She's speaking our language. Yeah, I mean, during the pandemic, you know, I, I mm -hmm. kind of burned out on cooking a little bit because there were Didn't so we many all? kids around. Is that it? Yeah, so they, that's it. Because pesto is so flavorful, it has garlic and, and you know, And do you need to oil the, the pan? Did you already oil it? You don't it? have to because there's oh. plenty of olive oil in the pesto mixture. So you basically, mix it all around mix like it all that. Around, and then look how Wait. beautiful it looks. Oh, my gosh, Jenna. we have to pull taste. it out of the oven. So I like to do a little balsamic Do you want us to help oh, Yes, glaze. Yes, help me and grab some go. Parmesan shavings. So do you just, that? I love balsamic glaze. Yes. I do everything I do. on anything. And you know what? I used to make my own by just reducing balsamic mm, for yeah. hours and the house would smell like vinegar and my kids would be like, what, what is that doing? smell? This so, is kind of crispy. It's delicious, isn't it? And see how all the oh veggies got beautiful color. Mm. Mm. But it's such We're, an easy meal and I would totally just eat this, but. Wait. We could do this too, which is huge. Look at what we just in did. In one second. Put it in the oven, is dress this basil? it. basil? What did you what is that? I tore basil. Oh, tore basil. Just, yep. And I, I'm so lazy, I don't even want to chop basil anymore. You just chop <laughs> it. By the way, I, I like it that. Exactly. Oh, the oh, should we go around the back? Yeah, more? we have another recipe. Okay, okay so great. Honestly, so mm -hmm. sheet pans are kind of my thing. I okay. love them. They're, they're just, I, I get nervous if I don't have 20 ready to go at mm -hmm. all times. So this is a sheet pan salad, and I love this concept mm. because you basically roast. Any veggie you want, it's it's the squash time of year. Okay. So yes. this is a mixture of cubed butternut squash Yum. and delicata squash. I love delicata what squash. What is that? I'm obsessed what is it? with it. Me too. Do you ever so put it on it? toast? Oh, Wait. yeah. Mash, mash yes. it up. Yes. What are you talking it's about? It's just so a squash. At, this is what it looks like. And oh, it's basically store? kind oh. of an heirloom type okay. of squash. But the great thing is you can eat the skin. It gets really tender. So ah. butternut, it can be a little bit tough, Should not I do, very tasty. Yes. Some? Drizzle and then we're salt gonna do pepper. another roasted vegetable situation, salt and pepper, Italian seasoning. This is so brilliant. Wow. And this then is just so toss. brilliant. But here's what's fun about what? it. So roast it and it's like 450, 25, 30 minutes. Okay. And look how gorgeous. So that's delicious on its own, but I build a salad oh, out of this. Thank you. So you make your own dressing too, don't you? Well, sometimes. Sometimes, sometimes I doctor up bottled dressing. So but I'm using the roasted vegetables as a base for mm, a salad. That's delicious. Mm. Isn't it good? Yeah. Yes. And the dressing mm. is tahini, mm. mustard, lemon juice, olive oil, honey. Okay. And then, isn't it pretty? 10 okay. plus. 10 plus plus. Pomegranate seeds. seeds. Yep. Mm. yep. Pistachios. Pistachios, pomegranates. Mm. So this I love is, pomegranates. It's pretty at Christmas. Mm -hmm. And then goat cheese, which Hoda Great. doesn't love. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Hoda well, likes it. It, it just doesn't love her. Yeah. Okay. There's a thank lot of TMI so in much. this segment. <laughs> There's a lot about Hoda. <laughs> anyway. Bree, <laughs> thank you so much for these recipes. Head today.com slash food. And for Bree's new book, it has recipes just like this one. Head today.com slash shop. I predict a bestseller. Me too. Okay. <laughs>
Yeah, and we're back with Today Food. Thrilled to say good morning to our next guest. Finally, after all of those teases, the pioneer woman herself, <laughs> Reed Drummond, has made it all the way from her ranch in Oklahoma. Are you near Blake's Ranch in Oklahoma? Not so much. Not so much but, you know, we're in the sta same state. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we, we know each other. When I was there marrying him and Gwen, I would have stopped by your ranch. Seriously. Of Next time. Or yes. your 25th wedding anniversary. I could have yeah, renewed yeah. your vows. <laughs> oh, well, Reese's we also out with a brand new cookbook. It's called Super Easy. It features more than 100 mm. shortcut recipes, which we like the sound of that. Actually, lots of them going on in the ranch in Oklahoma. You look absolutely stunning. You've got oh, a daughter who just got married, right? Yes. Hard to believe. Yeah, and you're ready to celebrate your 25th anniversary, and Carson's going to do your renew your vows for you. <laughs> that, that's hard lovely. to believe too. I know I'm only 29. I don't know how I can wow. get married. For you look 29. Years. What happened you to you? during COVID? All I did was eat and drink and not work out. And well, listen, same. I I was wearing pandemic pants this time last year. I don't know if you remember, but. But, uh, yeah, I just, you know, the wedding was a great inspiration and motivation. But then once I started kind of uh, exercising more and getting healthier, it felt so good yeah. that I just kept going. So I'm, I'm kind of glad I'm over that hump. And now it's about just maintaining and, and yeah. enjoying. Well, I don't so. know if these delicious recipes are going to be um, on any maintenance, but they are really smell good. Uh, speaking of my wellness journey, yes. let's eat some tots yes. Uh, yes. with cheese let's. all over them. So, yeah. It ahead. starts with chicken. Yep. Yes. So, I'm going to make tachos. Now, do you know what tachos are, Carson? No. No idea. You need to know. So, <laughs> tachos are just like nachos, but they're made with tots. Oh, Yum. Gosh. So, I baked, I baked some tots with a little we cumin and chili We have the gang eating powder, already. Right. Cook some chicken. Add some celery. So, these are buffalo chicken tachos. Yum. Celery, garlic, and green onions. Did you make up tachos or is that a thing? I never heard of tachos. It's kind of a thing, but it hasn't okay. swept the nation yet. Yeah, so it's I'm going now to. Will. I'm It'll kind of hoping. Uh, it'll but be anything trending by you the end of the segment. You can put on nachos, you can put on tots okay. and call them tachos. So Love it. Then, of course, buffalo sauce, and then you just let oh. this simmer. Mm. I started Delicious. with raw no. chicken, but you can do rotisserie chicken to okay. make it easier. Yeah. Mm. So simmer that until it's luscious. Have you and changed saucy. what you cook now because of your sort of wellness journey? Is it? Is it? Put you no. on a different path? Or you <laughs> no. <laughs> no, and you know, the thing is, is I have I have teenage boys, college students, uh, lad. Right, a, mm -hmm. ranchers. You know, yeah, cowboy, and so I have to make food that everybody loves. Right. And yeah. I don't, I'm not good when I deny myself, yeah. you know, whole Butter categories of food. So mm -hmm. I'm just kind of learning to eat. I like to say I, I eat a Rhode Island sized piece of cake instead of a Texas sized piece <laughs> right. of cake. That's the best way you get the flavors in the taste. How does that it's taste? Just, it's delicious. Really good. So Everything's good. good. So, yeah. good. so yeah. you, you pull the tots out of the oven. Mm -hmm. They're seasoned, so they're a little bit elevated. I mm -hmm. kind of push them into a pile. Yeah. Pepper jack cheese yeah. all over. I okay. mean, this this is what's a little spice. All about right oh, here. right here, yeah. And then you spoon the saucy chicken all oh, yeah. over. Mm -hmm. And so you can do ground beef that? and Got some hit, you know right? black beans and do sort of. A Is the chicken mix. gonna because it's hot melt that cheese? Or are you putting this back in the no, oven? No, it's going back in the oven. Okay, yeah. I so because okay. so, okay. you want to melt the cheese like uh, nachos. So all the cheese you want melted. Where's mine? Oh, here we go. That's okay. Okay. Yeah. The cheese. Actually, Pepper jack cheese, the buffalo yep. sauce. Mm. It's, it's hearty. It's, it's got a kick, uh -huh. but oh jeez! Did you know redheads can tolerate uh, spicy food more than anybody really? else? Really? Is that true? Yeah. true? Yeah. So this is good. Is that true? We love it. That's we'll delve good. into the genealogy Chicken. of that some other time. But, wow. but basically, you garnish with. Uh, Blue cheese, mm -hmm. and to make blue cheese dressing, I just take ranch dressing and mm -hmm. add blue cheese to it. Oh, oh and clever. It's Another very shortcut. easy. You can do bottled ranch or you can make your own, but Brilliant. nice little shortcut. Mm -hmm. So this is what, uh, this is why my teenage boys love me. Oh, I can see why. That is delicious. Hey, Carson. Really, yeah. really good. Hey, this is gone. I mean, just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wham. What happened? What is eating a whole bunt cake already. Oh, no, we have wow. not started the cake segment yet. <laughs> hey, take a breath. No one's missed these eating segments more than hosts. <laughs> so good. <laughs> Remember, Rhode Island, not Texas. <laughs> She's going state by state. <laughs> All right, well, that does bring us to our chocolate cake. Now, this is your secret recipe, right? Okay, yes. Yeah. So, confession, my, my top secret ingredient in my top secret cake is dark chocolate cake mix. Oh, okay. And what? listen, I had my house full of humans during the pandemic yeah. and large six, you know, six foot five humans yeah. and football players. And I had... I was making so much food that I was about to lose my religion. I mean, <laughs> every day I was just like, I can't do it anymore. So I'm not afraid to whip out the chocolate cake. I doctored it with 
you know, bittersweet chocolate chips just to make it a little bit more uh, rich. Wow. But the thing is... This is the secret. It's a box cake. Well, it's what, oh. yeah. Okay. But the thing is, I'm topping it with ganache, oh, no. which is Ooh. heavy cream wow. and good oh, well, quality go. chips. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. all, two ingredients. Yes. And then it turns into this Here. luscious... Mm. Ooh. And are these oh, inside too, or is this like a topping this thing becomes, situation? So, well, you can just eat one if you like. So you just but... make, okay, yeah. So you made the, the we cake. We gotta go. Oh, we're out of time. Okay, yeah. I really want to understand this, and then drizzle. Drizzle. Uh, I do sprinkles on top, <laughs> but <laughs> after Halloween, you can take Beautiful leftover cake. candy, chop it up, and top. put it on top. So oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Happy plate. She's Wait a minute. The plate. Oh, yeah. Show her, show it. Clean Literally. plate club. Clean plate club. Clean plate Done. club. Here's, you left a and she's going to eat owls. <laughs> and also, she's going to move in with you. And she's she's giggling. She's giggling a lot over there. Thank Congratulations you. on everything. Congrats. Love your show. Thank yes. you, guys. The best. Thank you. Thank you. All right, of course, you can find all these recipes at today.com slash food and pick up a copy of Super Easy at today.com slash shop. This morning on Today Food, lasagna two ways with layers of pasta, meat sauce, and creamy cheese. Lasagna is one of the ultimate comfort foods, but get ready for something a little new this morning. Reed Drummond, a.k.a. The Pioneer Woman, has created two recipes. They're going to become your favorites. Her latest book is called The Pioneer Woman Cooks the New Frontier. Reed, good morning. Hi, Savannah. It's good to see you. Now, I, I can't, you're doing something really different with lasagna, which is risky. Well, it's a little risky, but when you see these recipes, you will totally understand. I like to mash things up, and yep. you know, you don't want to make lasagna over and over and over, so we are going to make shrimp scampi lasagna roll-ups. I like it. Which mm. are as good as they sound. So okay. I cooked some shrimp in butter, onion, garlic, a little thyme, and... Um, Chopped it up. Okay. So I'm going to make a sort of a shrimpy, cheesy filling, and this is cream cheese, ricotta, egg, and parmesan. I mean, what could you? What could possibly go wrong? I know. So I mean, good. it's all right. Sign me up. Yes. So I'll let you stir this together, okay. and I'm going to start on the white sauce. Um, my new cookbook has lots of fun recipes like this. Yeah, where, I like that it's different. Yeah, and buffalo chicken quesadillas, for instance. Mm -hmm. I have two teenage boys at home. Yeah. Um, my girls grew up and left me. So, so, <laughs> so mean. now you've got those brutes at home. To so feed. rude of them. You still got Charlie the dog? Well, Charlie's not with us oh, anymore, but sorry. I have I have Walter. Okay. Oh, Walter. And I have a couple of other little bassets running around. Look so. at the whole crew over there. It's like so Oh my God! Could you ask that? Okay. But, okay. Oh no, it's okay. Charlie lives on in his books. Yes, and, he does. And, we read his book all the time. Oh, I love hearing that. Okay, so I, I stirred it. So that's all stirred together, and I am making just a beautiful white sauce, and okay. it's. I started with the roux, and it has cream and milk. Mm -hmm. And so you cook and cook and cook until and You're this trying is to thick. thicken it up, right? Thicken it up. Is that thick enough or pepper. not really? This looks great. Okay. This isn't quite there, but right. I have, I have some already television. finished. Yes. So I'm going to have you help me build a oh, roll-up. Okay. So this is the filling you just stirred together. Mm -hmm. Take about a generous third a cup. Okay. And put it on the end of the... Oh, this has the... Okay, the whole thing is in here. Our yeah. shrimp, our everything. And these are cooked lasagna noodles. Mm -hmm. I cooked them about half the time mm -hmm. that the package says. Right. And then just roll it up. Yep. That's the name, lasagna oh roll-ups. They're so cute and pretty. What do they you think, They are so cute. Oh my Amazing. God. Are you dying? Oh, yeah. my goodness. It's between bisque and a lasagna. Oh. Uh, good oh. point. That's exactly what it is. Oh. And then I always put the seam side down. Yeah, of course, to make it look pretty. I poured the white sauce in the bottom of the dish. Oh. And then I'll let you pour and the then rest gonna, of it. Am I pouring over. or am I drizzling? No, pour. Okay, pour, pour that sucker. Get in there. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Why not? Look at that creamy yummy. It is Isn't so that gorgeous. Good. Yes. And then top it with mozzarella. And you can see the finished dish right here with parsley on top. That doesn't look crazy difficult either. No, it's not. And my daughter who lives in Dallas now uh, saw my new cookbook and she said when I come home, will you make me the shrimp oh. scampi lasagna roll-up? So I mean, why not? Look at it. It's okay. gorgeous. I want to taste that. So that's lasagna one way, and the now second way. this shocked way, me. Lasagna soup. I mean, it's it's really earth-shattering. Okay, it's, tell me, tell me. I'm gonna have a bite. It's beautiful. Here. So started with ground beef, mm -hmm. sausage, uh, onion, oh. garlic, yeah. thyme, oregano, and I just cooked it, and then added. Mm. Oh my God! Just try that. Wait, Savannah, just not. take your Delayed time. Reaction. So good. <laughs> take okay. Your time. And just turned it into a really delicious uh, whole tomatoes, tomato paste, mm -hmm. uh, parsley, and you can see the whole tomatoes. I actually like to let them cook down a little bit. Yeah. And then break them up because oh. they're a little softer. Mm -hmm. Anytime I try to squeeze them with my hand, it winds up in my eye. Yeah. Or, <laughs> that's not fun. Or on my shirt, which is even worse. Even worse, exactly. <laughs> so you just kind of, you browned up the the uh, beef and then. Oh. Yes. Then you put in the drain the, the excess fat and then turn it into a beautiful soup. Mm -hmm. And then I cooked some 
broken up lasagna noodles. Oh. So this is back there. Mm. down at the bottom. Mm. It's like a hug. In. It is. Oh, <laughs> so really wait, what about point. the cheese? Where's the mm. cheese? Okay, so okay. once you simmer away the soup yes. and the noodles are perfect, I make this little ricotta dumpling mixture. Listen. Oh, wow. And all it is is ricotta, Parmesan, salt, pepper, basil, and oh, parsley. Mm -hmm. Stir it together. Mm -hmm. And then when you serve up the soup, you just put little dollops right in the middle. Oh and it's just, mm -hmm. if the soup is really piping hot, the yeah. ricotta dumpling Starts just kind of melts Can I come it. over to your house, mm -hmm. Reed? Yes, yes. Is this yes. what we make there? Because it sounds fab. Bring your kids and uh, lad will put them to work on the ranch. <laughs> yeah, I would love it. I love it. Thank you so much. We, how do you like Fantastic. the soup? It's I'm amazing. 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 Which one do you like I better? Love I love the oh. soup. Yeah. It's crazy. We, we're torn. Can you I tell? I, I like one vote for soup. And uh -huh. well, you know what though? And then you get a piece Switzerland of shrimp on this one. Yeah. That's the thing. Oh. And all that shrimp scampi oh. flavor is in there. You really redesigned it. lasagna. Yeah, that's, that's next level. Yeah, my wife I, loves your shit. I get bored really easily. <laughs> so I, I have to have some fun in the kitchen. Thank that's you true. so much, Rhea. I know you're coming back for the fourth yes. hour. More food. You can find all of these recipes at today.com/food. And for more on Rhea's book, go to today.com/shop. You can buy it there. Thank you, honey. Drummond is busier than ever. Not only is she a mom of four, she's a New York Times bestselling author. She has three million Instagram followers, and she's a star of the hugely popular Food Network show. It's called The Pioneer Woman. And somehow she's also managed to find time to put together a new cookbook called The Pioneer Woman Cooks the New Frontier, which features a couple of recipes that we're going to be making today. And she took all the photos for the book. It's, of course, she you does did everything. That too? She did that too. My Please? camera's a mess. My camera's sticky. <laughs> I all over it. So she's got roast chicken for us. Look at this. Yes, I. I'm so happy to cook we're, with you both. So I'm a big happy. fan of both of you. We so love thank you, you for having me. So wait, I can't cook. Yeah, me either. But wait, you're based in Oklahoma, and you just do your sh everything from your home. Is that pretty much? Works? We we film the show at our guest lodge, so yeah. at least they don't have to trip over my teenager's laundry, <laughs> yeah. you know, dirty socks in our real I house. I was telling but. her that my daughter Christina is like she is the most incredible woman. I her oh, voice puts me to sleep. I watch her. Her life is oh, idyllic. Yeah, my she, voice puts my husband to sleep too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're making chicken today. Yes, I just want to show you my favorite way to roast chicken. Okay. Uh, I'm wearing gloves just for the spatchcocking. Yeah. So do you know what spatchcocking no, a chicken is? No, no, so no. it's super no. easy. Basically, okay. you have to put on gloves, cut okay. the backbone out, which is just snip on either side. Okay. That's the unpleasant and part. Splay it out. But then you splay it out, and the whole point is to kind of. <laughs> 
hole. The whole point is right. to get it as flat as possible. You can use your palm and uh -huh. kind of push, mm -hmm. but that way a chicken that would normally take um, a lot longer to roast yes. just takes uh, really a fraction of the time. So then you wind up with uh, a beautiful roasted chicken. So what I like to do is make sort of an herb dressing Ooh, and it's just uh, simple olive oil, mm -hmm. herbs, cut some baby gold potatoes in half and just toss them in the herb mixture. How long does this take you to make? You want to help me oh, just sure, kind of scatter sure. them around and then you'd brush the same mixture on the chicken. Now is this Good a job. greased pan or is this not? It doesn't have it doesn't to be have because to be. the chicken has so much so uh, stuff. beautiful grease as it cooks. Okay. So just really about 30 minutes total. You start with a high heat and then lower it and then look what you wind up with. <laughs> wow. Halfway through I add cherry tomatoes mm. and zucchini and then put it back in and finish it up and you have this beautiful roasted chicken which I like to serve as roasted chicken, mm -hmm. but I also like leftover roasted Can chicken. Can we try this? Yes, of Maria, course. That's like your perfect meal, by the way. Right, that Have is. a bite. Yeah, chicken. I mean, oh. I like French fries, but yes. that, we're not having that. But I'm sorry, Maria. <laughs> I should have made no, we're fries. Not, we're not allowed to eat that. I think roasted chicken is the perfect mm. food. And that is yummy. It's good for weeknight family mm -hmm. meals. But Are you surprised at how your cooking, your passion, has turned into this incredible success? Well, you know, I think you nailed it. Just passion. If you if you are passionate about what you do, mm -hmm. it can you take you in directions you never thought you'd you'd go in. And that's um, I've had so much fun with Pioneer Woman because it started as mm -hmm. blogging. Mm -hmm. So come around. Oh um, and I want to show you what you can do with the chicken okay. if you don't want to slice it up and right. serve it as roast chicken. So you can shred it, mm -hmm. which is my favorite thing in the world. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to make a beautiful chicken and wild rice soup. Soup, oh, onion, yum. celery, and carrots. Okay. And then I'm going to deglaze with some white wine, which okay. I love in any soup. It just adds mm. beautiful flavor. And it's okay. getting to be soup weather out there. It's, yeah, it's getting to be. Finally, did you have a hot summer here well, like we did? We had, we had a scorcher. <laughs> it seemed to go on forever. And then add some flour just to thicken it okay. up. And then you'll cook this for a bit. Do all and your then, kids cook? No. Oh, yes. <laughs> Sadly, no. My daughter Paige loves to cook and she's a great cook. The rest mm. of my kids love to eat. So, uh, welcome to my plight. But I love to cook and so it's, it's, uh, What's it's that? chicken stock. Chicken stock okay. and then water. Mm -hmm. And this is so easy is wild this? rice. It's, oh, I didn't know it was that color. Yeah, it's not the mix that you buy in a box, oh. it's real wild rice. Um, Minnesota has, has wild rice okay. that kind of comes from Minnesota. And then you basically cook it until the rice is done and mm -hmm. look how beautiful it looks. That's gorgeous. Oh. And then you add the chicken in, obviously. Um, and I like to kind of cream oh, it up a little cream. bit. Yeah, you got I to. mean, I, d I can't think of many dishes that I make that aren't made better with a little cream. <laughs> exactly. So you can add a little or a lot and then let it simmer some more mm -hmm. with some aromatics, sage, and rosemary and thyme. Yes. And then I love to add Ooh. kale also. To at the, the soup? To the soup, oh, yeah. At the end, is that kind of the Kind last of at touch? the end, you yeah. just let it uh, simmer in the last few minutes. Tell us what this pasta situation yeah. is. Okay, so again, what you can do with the leftover chicken yeah. is make a chicken spaghetti casserole. And it's, I think, Casseroles are just the ultimate comfort food, and mm. this has mushrooms and mm. a little bit of wine, mm. of course. So, mm. if you can spatchcock a chicken, you can <laughs> do anything in life. <laughs> you can spatchcock a chicken. We need a t shirt that says that. <laughs> yeah. But really, you can make soup and casseroles, enchiladas. Marie, so. this was, these were all delicious, awesome meals. I mean, they seem easy enough, too. Very easy. Thank if you. it's not easy, I won't do it. Awesome. Oh, that's good. For these recipes, head to today.com slash food. And for more about Reese Cookbook, well, go to today.com slash shop.
everyone. Welcome back. We're back with Today Food. This morning's guest, you know her, you love her, Reed Drummond. She is known as the pioneer woman, and today she's showing us two easy recipes for a family feast. You've got a, a simple, easy pasta recipe. What are we cooking? Yes, so I am so into shortcut homemade ravioli. And what makes it shortcut is that I use wonton wrappers. So these are just in the store. And I made a little mixture of ricotta, Parmesan, salt, pepper, lemon zest. Wow. And I just put a little, I mm. can't get too close to you guys, but put a little dollop in the middle of the wonton wrapper. And then I just take my clean finger mm -hmm. <laughs> and rub a little egg wash around the edge. Oh. And then take a second wonton wrapper and put it on top, line up the edges. And then you just want to press it together. Oops, I grabbed three. That's okay. <laughs> it's, I'm doing this on the fly. And then just force all the air out. And honestly, if you can't make, make homemade pasta dough or you don't have time, this is such a great shortcut. I like that. And then you just can get an assembly line with your kids, make as many of these as you want, and then just drop them into salted water one by one. And look. All right, I love it's those. Little pieces of ravioli. Just Delicious. Fresh hey, and ready to go. Hey, Reed, can we, we only have a minute, but we want to get to that dessert, that, what is it? Ice it's box, ice box yeah. cake. Oh, yeah. Blackberry ice box cake. So the frozen pound cakes that we all know and love, I shave the top off, crumble it into crumbs, pour in butter. Very easy. And then just put this on the stove top, toast the crumbs. Mm. And then the cake that's left, you slice the cake into three slices lengthwise. I already started a layer, and it's cake, a mixture of jam, blackberries, and lemon juice, Yum. and lemon zest. Huh. It's so fun to use a frozen pound cake because then you cut that whole well, step. Oh, my gosh. Uh, it you doesn't know, even look hard to do. Re, it looks delicious. Something Savannah so, I could make. We're happy. Yeah. All right. We you just layer it kind of like lasagna. All right. Cake, jam, cream. Re, and then you wind we up. love you. We love you. We can't wait for your book to come out. Thank you for cooking for us. Uh, you can check out Thank her you, recipes girls. at today.com slash food. Welcome to The Boost. Over the next half hour, we're going to hope to boost your day with a few stories that will leave you feeling inspired. So today is National Piano Day. So stay tuned for a piece about tickling the ivories. But first up, a story that shows gratitude through letter writing. At Roseville Middle School near Detroit, the simplest of projects is reminding students and staff about the power of words. Are you wondering why you're here? Yeah. <laughs> Reading teacher Stacy Earl had a big idea. What did you ask your staff to do? I asked my teachers, secretaries, custodians, our cooks at lunch to write a card to a student, anyone of their choice, of why they inspire them. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So this year, they surprised some of the students with handwritten notes of gratitude. The reason why we invited you down here today is because we wanted to tell you that you inspire Miss Moore and I <laughs> to come to work every day. The kids had their parents' permission to be filmed by the school. You're amazing. Thank you and so I love much. You. <laughs> you can see the experience was profoundly moving for both students and staff. You give me so much love in my heart and I love having class with you guys. So I wanted to give you and say thank you. Come here. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, now a real hug. <laughs> oh. oh. You're amazing. <laughs> English teacher Emily Grimes presented letters to four students, including Amaya Brown. What is it about Amaya that you wanted to recognize? Her, her leadership. I narrowed it down to her because I, I guess the bottom line is that she's shown me that she's there for me as I am there for her. I wrote something for you. Social worker Julie Cooper's yeah, message brought eighth grader Alicia Turner to tears. To I'm really grateful you're here. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay. <laughs> yeah. She is an inspiration for me um, to come to work, and I really cherish the relationship that we have. She gives you good advice when, when you need it. More than 50 heartfelt letters in all, lifting up students and educators alike. You light up our classroom with your kindness, and you are going to make the world a better place. So. Showing up for each other in the most basic but powerful way. Another place we often write is in the classroom, but instead of letters, this English teacher uses running to help her students go the distance and further their education. Take a look. With every step, every exhale, and every mile that Kate Fletcher runs, the 11th grade English teacher is providing hope to her students at Louisa County High School. Since 2016, her Lion Pride Run Scholarship has made it possible for some of her seniors to further their education. I've been teaching at Louisa County High School for 17 years, and it's a major source of the meaning in my life. Kate is an amazing teacher. Kate is the kind of teacher that everybody wants to have. She goes out of her way to make it easier for her students. It makes this class honestly feel like a family. The Lion Pride Run is a run to raise scholarship funds for our seniors. So many kids have the potential, they just don't necessarily have the economic means. The very first Lion Pride Run took place in a single school day and clocked around 40 miles. Each year, she added miles to her journey, from clocking laps around the school track to another year running all the way to the state capitol in Richmond, Virginia. And this year, she set her sights on making an even bigger splash, running 105 miles over two days from the high school to the National Mall in Washington, D.C. When she told me that she wanted to run to D.C., we were kind of worried about her. I was like, that's crazy. Like, why would anyone want to run that far unless they're being chased. And I would say it was around mile 80 that I really felt it throughout my entire body. That's when that little voice comes that says, you're not going to make it, maybe you should quit. And it was 2.30 in the morning and she started getting really upset that she was letting people down. And I had had all of these Lion Pride Run recipients send in their thoughts about Kate. And at that point she started to read messages from students. And it was like, I've used my Lion Pride money to help me to pay for classes. And that definitely motivated me. When she made it to D.C., I felt relieved for her. I was crying. I could see crowds of kids. I could hear the, the high school band. Um, they played the Rocky theme for me. And for them to be standing out there in the rain and the cold just means the world to me. She does it for students like Jamesia Thomas, a mother and college graduate now working a full-time job and pursuing a master's degree. Jamesia was one of the first Lion Pride Run scholarship recipients. I am a first-generation college student. Ms. Fletcher has inspired me to pursue my dreams despite any obstacle. And I actually never knew the struggles that she had. I didn't really have a consistent um, childhood with both of my parents in my life. And that's not something that she allowed to get in the way of her pursuit of education. I've always gone after what I want and I don't let anything get in the way of that. And in that way, she really exemplifies those core characteristics of the run. I'm currently a sophomore at William & Mary. This scholarship has allowed me to really just focus on my education. I come from a low-income family and it helped me be able to afford a college education. I am a first-generation college student and now will be graduating with zero dollars in debt. Since 2016, the Lion Pride Run Scholarship has raised over $95,000 and it has helped over 35 students reach their full potential and have a chance to further their education. Ms. Fletcher, Thank you for your ongoing support and love. Thank you for everything you do for me. I really appreciate you and all you do for our community here in Louisa. We love you.
Welcome back to The Boost in honor of National Piano Day. We are sharing the remarkable story of a musician who is shining a light on classical music. Al Roker has that story. You can tell a story with no words. I think that's what really interests me about classical music is the journey that it takes you on. Black Bach, born Charles Wilson III in Detroit, started playing the piano at just four years old. After years of study, not to mention a family of musicians behind him, he was soon playing in local jazz clubs and lounges. My first piano uh, cost my parents 100 bucks and my dad got some black paint and he painted it all up and we got it tuned. It was enough for me to, you know, learn and uh, become proficient on it. I understand your mom had a certain way of helping you keep rhythm. Yeah, she would chop vegetables. <laughs> really? <laughs> be, yeah. When I would practice, she would bring whatever she was cooking into mm -hmm. the piano room and she would sit there and she... All that practice paid off. Along the way, Bach fell in love with classical music and that fuels his drive to change any preconceived notions about who should have a relationship to him. How did you come up with the name Black Bach? I went into my cultural roots, which mm -hmm. are in hip hop, and I decided, well, why not a rap name? Even though you're doing classical Even music? Even though I'm doing classical music, yeah. Also, it's a, um, it's a tribute to Johann Sebastian Bach, who was a disruptor for his time. He was uh, creating music that people didn't understand, but then when they did understand it, it was, wow, this is brilliant. Are you a disruptor? I would like to think so. Um, How so? People don't normally listen to classical music. I would love to be the entrance ramp for more people. Bach's dexterity on the keys has also landed him on stage with artists like Rihanna. Searching for the right, but it keeps avoiding me. Which is very classical. <laughs> and he records covers to post online. When you're listening to popular music, do you hear the classical parts of it? It's still the same harmonic structure, it's still the melodic structure. It's just a different version of it. What do you do with Cardi B? One of the cool things that can happen is, you know, the, the bass line is... Which is super cool. <laughs> Bach now has something to say with what he describes as a neoclassical sound that's all his own on Black Book Deluxe. My album is inspired by the movie Green Book, which is the story of Don Shirley and his trailblazing spirit to go to the South, the Deep South, at a time where it wasn't safe, but to bring music there. What are you trying to convey with these songs? These songs are reflections of where we are mm -hmm. as a society. They're also reflections of things and experiences that I've had myself. Bach gave me a sampling of his compositions created during the pandemic lockdown, starting with The Hustle Is Real. So what's the inspiration for that? If you walk out in the street in New York City, that's what it feels like. It feels like people moving. Now, a completely, obviously different tone and, and, and message, George, George Floyd and the, and the struggle for equality. I want to present a sense of hope. You know, like, let's be hopeful that tomorrow this doesn't happen again. Where do you want to go from here? I just want more people to be able to enjoy this music and to understand that, you know, classical music is for everyone. It is not just for, for uh, one group of people, it's mm -hmm. for everyone. From one pianist to another, this 10-year-old taught himself to play by watching YouTube videos, and he hopes to inspire others to learn something new. While most kids his age are playing video games, Ashe Touré is playing Mozart, Chopin, and Bach, the classical favorites. It all started when Ashe was just 10 years old, and he took a second look at his aunt's old, dusty piano in the garage. We brought the piano in the house, and felt like that's when the magic happened. He asked me where the middle C was, and I showed him, and he sat there and he started playing. 
took off from there. He learned, started learning where all the rest of the keys were. And we were just amazed. Within a year, we couldn't believe how far he had come. I was like, wow, you know, this kid is something else, you know? And only after one year, the self-taught prodigy took his talents to the stage. One performance after another and another. Whatever I'm feeling at the moment, really, I like the piano because it's an art, and with art, you express your emotions through it. Over the years, he's branched out into jazz, rap, and gospel music with his church choir. But his natural talent doesn't come without challenges. He often shows up, and he's the only one that looks the way he looks. And so he goes in with the confidence that he can go at it just as good as anyone else that's there. He doesn't fold when things get difficult. He'll stay the course and stay the part. And that's kind of how he's always uh, approached things in his life. Ajay hopes that his love for classical music will inspire others like him. I think it's good for them to know that they don't have to be stuck in their athletics bubble or their academics bubble or like business or tech stuff. They can do whatever they want. And all it takes is them stepping out outside of their comfort zone. People might like, your friends who are similar to you might kind of judge you at first or like kind of tease you for it. But as long as you enjoy it, I think that's all that matters. Now Ajay is bringing his piano skills and his fearlessness to tomorrow's talent today. Ajay, <laughs> wow. Ajay, it's so good to see you. How are you, honey? I'm doing well. How are you guys? Well, we're so excited to see you. By the way, we love your lane, this classical lane. What, what was it about the classics that you fell in love with? Well, from the start, I kind of just loved how complex it is. And like, <laughs> I just thought this is something that I could do. I knew it would, be, it would be challenging, but I mean, I'm up to the challenge, not afraid to make any mistakes, just whatever. Yeah. You know, obviously your parents helped yeah. inspire you. I think you're born an artist as yeah. well and fearless, as we said. For all, all of those people out there that may be a little scared of taking yeah. a risk or stepping outside their comfort zone, what do you say? I say initially it might be like you might be drawn away from it. People might think that uh, you like you you shouldn't be doing this. Like that's not in your lane. But like. All it takes is you is just for you to try it. I mean, like, once you try it, you'll get to know like if you really want to do it, if you don't. But it's all up to you to try. You will never know if you don't try. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, you, you're loved by a lot of people. Um, <laughs> we know that you love Nas. You're a fan of Nas's, but you might also be a fan of yours. Let's take a look. <laughs> Ajay, what's up? It's Nas. <laughs> hey, man, keep doing what you're doing. You're very talented. I see you, the world sees you, and um, yeah. it's beautiful, man. Bless. Wow. Beautiful. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> oh. Ajay, oh, well, we also know, as not, it's not just Nas who loves you. We have a su surprise for you. All of your fans, the people that love you, are right here on the Zoom wall. Got your grandparents, wow. your piano <laughs> teachers, <laughs> brothers, cousins. Your friends. <laughs> <laughs> Yo. Party on. You That's know what? Maybe, maybe you can't have a big audience, but you certainly have a great audience <laughs> with us right now. What are you going to perform for us, Ajay? Uh, I will be performing the third movement of Rebel's Sonatine. All awesome. right. Take it away. Thank you. 
I want to cry for an hour. <laughs> that was so good. Wow. RJ, oh. look, there's some hashtags proud. You rock. You we, sure do. You've got incredible talent, Thank RJ. You, uh, congratulations. Thank you. And you got a long runway, babe. Can't wait to see where you wind up. Um, and you have a great group around yes, you. Yes, so. and tell your parents we said whatever yeah. they did to pass it on to us. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Coming up, one nonprofit bakery recipe for success that is inspiring America right after this. We are stepping into the kitchen now and we're introducing you to a bakery changing the lives of aspiring young chefs. Kate Snow had that story. It's a busy day for the crew at Rising Above Bakery in Nyack, New York. How many cookies do you want? 21 year old Connor Carson likes being part of a team. What do you bake now? I'm baking um, breads, cookies, scones. Got it. All right, tell me when it's ready. Founder right. Shiri Raveni Ulrich was an avid baker and speech therapist who noticed years ago when she baked cookies with her students with special needs, they lit up. They found their voice in the kitchen. It was just beautiful. So during COVID, she started a bakery in her own house. This oven was in your dining room. Yes. For a long time. Yes. This January, they finally moved to a temporary storefront, employing young adults with developmental disabilities supported by volunteers. What's the idea? To give them a meaning, to wake up in the morning and say, I want to go to work. I want to be as important as anyone else. I'm going to take the glaze that's already done here. Luke Garrison showed me how to make a maple glaze. I do make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. But I've learned, I grow and learn from them. It's just so much harder. Lisa Carson is Connor's mom and serves on the bakery's board. The minute he walked in the door, what he brought to the table was valued. They really saw him for who he was. Rising Above Bakery won't have this space much longer. The nonprofit is raising money, hoping to secure a permanent storefront. What do you like about working here, Connor? Being seen, I think it's the most important thing. Being um, seen? Being seen. So that means, like, I think, um, like, having customers come in and see how we can work together. Do you think this place has kind of changed your life? I think it did, yes. Um, it really opened my eyes to see who, who I am. And that is the sweetest recipe of all. Kate Snow, NBC News, Nyack, New York. Now, the incredible story of a college student who's using her platform to educate and empower one TikTok at a time. I pride myself in being positive and searching for joy wherever I can, regardless of what life throws at me. I want to roll with it. 
college student Maya Paul calls herself an accidental activist. Take me back to your childhood and what you were like as a kid. Growing up, I was a wild child. I was full of energy, super rambunctious. I would literally run laps around the house. It was sophomore year in college for you that things started to take a turn, is that right? I was living off of chips and Pop-Tarts and getting two hours of sleep, so when I was feeling weak and tired, I was like, mm, I'm just an irresponsible college student. No big deal, but the weakness and fatigue continued to get worse until it reached a point where I was collapsing, walking back from my classes. After being diagnosed with a genetic condition and a probable neurological disorder, Maya became wheelchair bound and began to notice how difficult it was to get around. It's unfortunate because oftentimes people's only exposure to disability is when they become disabled or someone close to them does. And now I just have to clear a space for me to sit. So I just hook the chairs with my own chair. I want you to explain to someone who may not know, who may have the best of intentions, what does it feel like to be in a wheelchair and not have resources or to feel invisible? To know that there is a world out there that chooses to exclude you, that chooses to not make the necessary changes to create systems that can support you is soul crushing. To know that for the rest of my life, I'm going to be looking at tens of thousands of dollars extra for anything that I want is frustrating, soul crushing, and heartbreaking, especially when I know it doesn't have to be this way. So Maya decided to join TikTok and try to raise money for an emotional support animal. And I posted my first dance video. People were like, oh my God, you're moving your leg, you're faking your disability. And then I realized that I could bring awareness to the issues that I wish I had known before I became disabled. Everywhere I go, I come across countless access barriers. Today, Maya has more than 420,000 followers. Her username? I'm a roll with it. Along with TikTok dances, she posts informative videos to educate people about everything from her daily life to injustices faced by the disabled community. What is the positive response that you've seen? It tells me that the world is ready for change. I'm not sure if you can see it, but on my door, there's the thing that makes your door close a bit more slowly. A lot of them are really tight, which makes the door extremely heavy, which reduces access for people with strength issues, with pain issues like arthritis or wheelchair users. And so I made a post talking about how there's an adjustable setting and I received hundreds of comments like, I'm going to work tomorrow and I'm going to check on it. So it's really exciting to see people who are going back and making actual accessible changes. Changes. What do you want people watching this story to understand about people who are living with a disability? Disability is not a bad word. Nobody is guaranteed ableness. You can become disabled at any point in time without any warning. So it's better for everyone to make better systems to support disability. Maya hopes to change minds, hearts, and even policies, and of course, to continue to dance. I didn't dance in my wheelchair for over a year. I had days where I felt like my body just wouldn't let me, and I learned it doesn't matter. I got to dance every single day. When we come back, we've got the latest viral video that'll put a smile on your face. Stay with us. We've got one final video for you, and that'll make you smile. 
Matt Turner, he's the goalkeeper for the U.S. men's national team. He has a lot to celebrate this morning. So it started with a shutout win over El Salvador last night in Orlando. And then a couple of minutes later, he was surrounded by his teammates and his family to find out the gender of his second baby. So, Matt, if you're ready, give that ball a kick in. Five, four, three, two, one. Oh, there you go. Awesome. Turner family. It's <laughs> nice. so good. The announcer makes it. I'm out Roll there. That. There you got it, Matt. This is oh. wife Ashley. Baby girl coming into the world later this year. The couple also have a baby boy named Easton. He was born last July. That's it for today. Come back tomorrow. We've got more of our favorite feel-good stories. We'll see you next time right here on Today All Day. and thanks for joining us for Consumer Confidential. I'm Vicki Wynn. The headlines can be troubling. A recent spike in violence across the country. In New York City alone, NYPD's recent data shows crime is up 38% overall this year. Shootings have risen 32%. Transit crime, that's up 70%. And car thefts, those have jumped a staggering 93%. Several other cities also reporting a major spike in carjackings, including Minneapolis, where it's up 63% and 85% in Philadelphia. Now, these numbers can shatter our sense of security. That's why for the next 25 minutes, we're focusing on personal safety and protection. Learn simple ways to protect your property without spending a lot of money. As we start planning spring and summer vacations, what can you do to make sure thieves don't know you're gone? Plus, what to look for when you're shopping for one of those popular doorbell cameras and some basic self-defense techniques so you can escape an attacker. But first, how to navigate potentially dangerous encounters during everyday activities from commuting to shopping. A spate of recent violent crimes caught on tape. In Philadelphia, this man pulls a woman out of her car and takes off, leading to a wild chase that ends on foot where police finally arrest him. In Chicago, two men approach a woman and push her up against a wall. Police say they stole her belongings and ran off. In San Jose, California police say this man breaks the window, snatches a purse from a woman sitting inside, and takes off in a getaway car. FBI data shows assaults and vehicle theft have increased from 2014 to 2020. So how can you protect yourself in some everyday scenarios? I enlist the help of former NYPD detective Mike Sapriconi, who is now the president of Squad Security. So here we are in a shopping center. What do we need to be aware of? You want to be at a place close to the location you're going. And park next to a lamppost, especially during the winter when it gets dark earlier. So, Mike, I feel like a common time that you're vulnerable is when you're just getting back from the store, you're distracted, you're putting things in your car. What do we need to know here? Pay attention. Look at your surroundings. Put the things in your car as quickly as possible. Check around. Make sure there's nobody else watching you or observing you. What if someone comes up and they want my purse? Give it to them. Your no purse. fighting. Don't fight. Never fight. Give them your purse. Let them take your purse. What should I do when it comes to my car keys? I would put them in my pocket along with your phone on your person okay. rather than put them in the purse because if they snatch your purse, at least you still have a way to get out of here with your car. Cities across the country have reported spikes in violent carjackings. Watch this incident in broad daylight in the middle of New York City. Carjackings last year up 55% in New York, 63% in Minneapolis, and 85% in Philadelphia. It might sound counterintuitive, but some experts say part of the reason carjackings are increasing has to do with the fact that cars are more secure now than ever before. You've probably seen it in the movies. Thieves starting a car like this. Oh my God, you know the hot wire car? But nowadays, new cars rely on key fobs, and that makes it a lot harder for thieves to get away unless they have this. Remember to keep your car doors locked, even while driving. Mike says make sure your windows are up high enough that someone can't reach in. Mike, let's say I'm stopped and some people come up and they try to carjack me. What do I need to know? Always give them the car. Unless you have your children in the back seat or something, give them the car. It's not worth it. Mike, it's cold out. A lot of people like to warm up the car before they get in or they leave it running because they're going to go in the store real quick. What say you? No, definitely not. No, no value to doing that. It's an opportunity. When the thieves see the smoke coming, that's like a smoke alarm coming to them and saying, hey, there's a call. Let's take it. As for public transit, Mike says stay vigilant. He investigated many crimes where thieves targeted distracted riders. He says the risk starts when you enter. 
be careful on the stairs, an easy place for pickpockets to snatch your valuables from behind. Vicky, I just got your phone. Your bag was wide open, you weren't paying attention, and it was so easy for me to just grab your phone out of your bag. So what should I do? Pay attention, move your bag to the front, okay. walk your bag, then be aware of somebody walking behind you on the steps. Mike, what about this? A lot of times people are commuting, they put earbuds in. Bad idea. It, it just takes away one of your senses. You should never have something that can't let you hear everything that's going around you. Avoid the temptation to stand near the track and pay attention to anyone coming into your personal space you know people have a tendency they want to see when the train's coming they get close to the edge what do you say about that step aside always step back stay six feet off the, the yellow the yellow's there for a reason when it's time to board try to ride in the car with the conductor in new york city they always pull up to these zebra stripes all right mike so we get on the train where's the safest place to sit i would always think the middle is the safest place not by a door okay. because if you sit by a door somebody can be lingering or they're watching you as the door's open you can snatch your bag what if the train's crowded there's no seats hold the pole, get by a pole okay. in the middle of the train mm -hmm. and put your purse between your body and the pole. Oh, okay. Some good reminders to help you stay alert and safe. Our thanks to Mike for that. And a bonus tip, if you are riding public transit in most cities, sit in the front car. That is often where the train operator is located. And when you're parking at a mall, look for that security booth in the parking lot. Try to find a spot near the guard shack. Coming up, it was made to keep track of your belongings, from keys to purses, but some have reported Apple's popular air tags have been used for stalking. What you need to know. And later, simple things you can do to beef up security at home without breaking the bank. Consumer Confidential, coming right back. A warning now about popular tracking devices from Apple. They're called AirTags, and they track the locations of common items like your keys and your wallets. But people across the country have reported being stalked by strangers. We took one out to see how it can happen. I was at the bar alone. Model Brooks Nader was at a crowded bar in Manhattan when she says someone dropped an Apple AirTag into her coat pocket. The device, roughly the size of a quarter, links to a cell phone through the Find My app designed to help you track your things. But now it's being linked to concerns about safety and privacy. When I was almost home, I got this notification on my home screen pop up saying that I was being tracked and I had been for a while now. Um, which is basically when I knew something wasn't right. Nader estimates the AirTag was in her pocket for five hours. The device's owner able to track her every move before she got that alert. I also didn't know what an AirTag was or anything like that. So I was definitely worried and concerned. And Nader isn't alone. Okay, so I think I'm being tracked. In. On social media, others reporting finding random air tags. I was being informed that there has been an air tag that has been following me. Tucked in, tucked in right here. 
Law enforcement agencies across the country are also warning these air tags can be used to track cars, allowing criminals to steal the vehicles once they're parked overnight. It's literally been like tracking her car. To show you how these air tags work, I'm teaming up with investigative producer Joe Enoch. Joe, what do you got? Vicky, I got my air tag. Okay. I'm going to put it in your purse. All right. We'll see what happens. Bye. Bye. I hit the streets of New York City with Joe watching me from his desk. First stop, got to warm up, get something to drink. Must be time for a coffee break. Able to see the exact stores I go in. Vicky is definitely doing some shopping at Sephora. Will it work in the subway? All right. Here we go. Underground. Anywhere there's a cell signal, Joe can see the air tag in my bag moving with me. Vicky is really moving now. My guess she's on the subway. Taxi ride. One last stop. Finally, time to head to lunch. Joe's not far behind, using his phone to track my location. It looks like it's just right up here on the right. The device leading him right to me. Whoa! <laughs> hey! You found, found, oh my gosh! Right there. There, wow. Yep. You pinpointed me right to my table. Exactly. <laughs> All with this little guy here. It was easy. If you had slipped this in without telling me, I would have had no clue that you were following my every move. Scary. Yeah, that is pre pretty scary. I didn't receive a warning notification until I got home. It is now four hours after Joe put the tag in my purse, and I just got the alert that there was an air tag somewhere near me. Apple says those alerts make it harder for air tags to go undetected. The company also updated the air tags to sound this alarm if they're away from their owners for 8 to 24 hours. In a statement, Apple says, we take customer safety very seriously and are committed to AirTag's privacy and security. AirTag is designed with a set of proactive features to discourage unwanted tracking, a first in the industry, that both inform users if an unknown AirTag might be with them and deter bad actors from using an AirTag for nefarious purposes. Now, this is important. Experts say if you get that alert or you find an air tag in your belongings, don't go home. That could reveal where you live. Instead, go immediately to your local police department or a public place and then call police and ask them to meet you. Apple told us they will work with law enforcement to help track down the actual owner of the air tag. Now, following our report, Apple did make some changes to its air tag. Joining us now to talk about that and much more is tech expert and Tom's Guide global editor in chief, Mark Spoonauer. Mark, great to see you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. All right. So so let's start with these changes that Apple made. I don't think they anticipated that bad guys would use their air tags in this way, but we saw what can happen. So what are they doing about it? Yeah, in a way, they've made tracking almost too easy, right? Not just for items, but for people. So what they've promised is that they're going to be rolling out some changes later this year. I wish we actually had a timetable for those changes, but they're important and they're threefold. So first, the sound of the alerts will actually get louder. That's one of the complaints okay. that we had in our initial reviews, that yeah. it was just too faint, especially if it's underneath a couch. So what about a car? Right, right. exactly. You won't hear it. <laughs> exactly. So the, the second change is that it's going to be easier and faster the time element is really key yes. to get those alerts because it can't be hours that pass, it right. needs to be minutes. Uh. And the last thing is precision finding. So the same feature that's available to you and I mm -hmm. using augmented reality and the live camera view so you'll get an exact location of where that air tag is using the camera and arrows that direct you directly to it. Wow, really interesting. Well, it's good to see that they are doing something, and I think that makes people feel a lot better. So what are some of the things that people can do to take advantage of other types of personal technology, like our phones, to help make us safer? Well, I think the number one thing is that if you're using your phone right now, turn off location services if you don't need it. And there are some apps that say use it only while using the app. Right, or, like Google Maps. Right, or all the time in the background. And I would say turn that off. Don't use that unless you absolutely need it. There are ways to share your location with family and friends and specialized apps for that, which is fine. Okay. But I would turn that off. The other thing is I would turn off Wi-Fi and Bluetooth if you don't need it because there mm. are other vectors for p potential attacks that you don't want to activate. But the other important thing that people don't realize is that your phone itself can be an SOS beacon, mm -hmm. right? So look at the SOS features that are built into the iPhone and Samsung phones, for example. So you just press the side button and slide to activate it on the iPhone. On Samsung, you just press the power button a few times to activate it there. And don't just know how to activate the feature. Make sure that you fill out your emergency contacts on your iPhone or Samsung device to make sure that when that ping is sent out, it's not just going to law enforcement. As soon as you hang up with 911, your family members will also be notified. So set that up on your phone. Oh, that's really good. And turning off Wi-Fi and Bluetooth can help save your battery, too. So that's a good yes. tip. <laughs> Let's talk about doorbells. What should people know before they invest in a doorbell camera? 
Well, number one is that the video quality is definitely getting better, but there are certain features that you need to look for when you're buying a video doorbell. One is look at the aspect ratio and how wide mm -hmm. the, the viewing angle is. Wider is better? Yeah, so wider is better, but also taller. Okay. So you want to be able to look at packages as they're delivered and other things that are there. And some people can try to duck down when you're oh. when you're using your doorbell camera. So look at, make sure you have an ultra wide viewing angle and also make sure that it's tall. The other thing is uh, make sure that you're signing up for the, the video storage online. Mm -hmm. And if you can, make sure that you have a battery backup as well as local storage if it's available to you as an option because you don't want to necessarily have to rely on, on the cloud. Got it. So you have two places, that video, that may be valuable in case a crime is committed. To, to find it. Yeah, and the last thing is make sure that you're looking for a package detection because these cameras are getting smarter. It used to be the case that if a leaf would blow by, <laughs> you would mm -hmm. get an alert. Right. But now they're that. smart enough to recognize pets, faces, and packages. So look for a doorbell that has all of these features built in. And quickly now, when it comes to security, what apps do you recommend? Um, I mean, there's a bunch out there that we like, but one that is really good is called Noonlight. And it's a personal safety app, and it's almost like a panic button on your phone. It's very light. Yes, okay. and it's very easy to use. So all you have to do is just press that button. It's almost like a security system on the go, right? Oh, wow. The authorities and police will be notified, and they'll go directly to your location, and your friends and family will be notified. Plus, there's this timeline feature built in so that, let's say you're going on a Tinder date, you can actually fill out that information, mm -hmm. and then your friends and family will be contacted, and they'll have that context in terms of where you were supposed to be versus where you are. Learned so much. Mark Spoonauer, <laughs> thank you so much for coming in and sharing all your expertise. Really appreciate it. And up next, simple moves to help you escape an encounter with a would-be attacker. But first, when we come back, how to make your home less attractive to thieves, even when you're on vacation. You're watching Consumer Confidential. Now a closer look at home security across the country caught on camera brazen crooks smashing windows, knocking down doors, even impersonating police officers. These cases can make us feel vulnerable. With spring break right around the corner, you may be traveling or leaving your home unattended, but there are some easy ways to protect your space from thieves. From coast to coast, home security camera footage released by police captures burglars in action. In New York City, these crooks posed as police officers to get inside, overpower the homeowners, and walk off with $130,000 in cash and jewelry. In Phoenix, burglars deploy a battering ram to break in. In Los Angeles, a mother and her baby followed home and robbed in their driveway. 
And in Beverly Hills, 81-year-old philanthropist Jacqueline Avant, wife of famed music executive Clarence Avant, shot dead in her home. Police apprehended and later charged this suspect, who also attempted to break into another nearby home. Though national statistics show burglaries are in decline, these cases can shatter our sense of security. While it can be scary to think about these crimes, there are simple steps you can take to prevent the criminals from targeting you and your home. I enlist the help of Mike Zapraconi. He's a former NYPD detective with 16 years of experience. He's now the president of Squad Security, a global security firm. Mike, when it comes to these bad guys breaking in, what's the first thing we should know? Well, these are crimes of opportunities, so we want to make it as difficult as possible for them to come to your home and break in. What's the most common way criminals get into someone's home? Basic things, checking doors, checking windows. They're going to look for something that might be open, unlocked, like this. Uh. If it's locked, they're going to move on. Mike says breaking windows and doors can alert neighbors, and many criminals will move on if there isn't a convenient way in. Another common thing people do, they hide the key under the doormat or maybe nearby the front door. Anywhere in proximity of the door, they're going to check. Don't do it. If you have a security system, Mike says to occasionally call your company to make sure the software and equipment are up to date. No alarm system? He says a video doorbell can be a cheaper alternative. These days, many of us also rely on delivery services, so our packages can pile up. We all know about porch pirates, mm -hmm. but this is also a key that no one's home at all. And the more things you leave out, more people are going to know you're not home. Got to get these inside quickly. Always, quick as possible. What if you have to go on vacation and you're going to leave your home empty? You want to make your home feel as secure as possible. So you want to always try to do as much as you can to make that person, the burglar, think someone's home. You want to maybe leave lights on, put some shades down. You want to be able to not have somebody be able to look into your window mm -hmm. and see that nobody's around. And if you park your car outside, keep your car doors locked because if you have an automatic garage door opener programmed inside, it'll work even if there are no keys. Mike says thieves sometimes strike right when you get home. So look around before getting out of your car. Be aware of your surroundings and avoid talking and texting on your phone. Let's say you come home and something's not right. The door is open, a window's open. What should you do? Step back for a minute. Call 911, get to a safe place, give them a description, what you saw. Don't go inside. So what happens, Mike, if you're inside and someone breaks in? Don't confront them. Step back, give them whatever they're asking for. is usually property. You get a really good description, and then when the opportunity comes, call the police once you're safe. Mike, again, with those great tips. And don't forget about the items you leave outside around the house. A spade can be used to smash a window. A ladder can be used to get into your second floor. So clean up those tools. Also, if you are going away, ask a friend or a neighbor to pick up your mail. Or you can also request the post office to put it on hold while you're gone. Well, next up, we're going to be hanging out with two black belts. When we come back, learn some self-defense moves to help you get out of a potentially dangerous run-in.
There are some simple things you can do if you ever find yourself in a dangerous encounter. We're all geared up. The key really here is to give yourself enough time to make a run for it. To help us with all of that, martial arts instructors Sharice King and Adam Ladd, thank you both for being here. You're a second degree black belt. Adam, you're a fifth degree black belt. Combined, you have more than 50 years of experience. Okay, so Sharice, let me start with you. Not all of us can have this kind of experience, but what if you are just a beginner and you want to stay safe and, and just some basic tips to keep yourself safe when you're out there? All right, some basic things you want to think about when you're outside is just being aware. Being aware is one of the things that you, if you just know your surroundings, you'll be, you'll you kind of see things happening, mm -hmm. right? Like when I'm on a train, I'm always looking around, somebody comes on, I want to see who, what, you have, what kind of bag you're holding, if you look suspicious, I'll leave the train, I'll go to the next cart, right? right. So just being aware, uh, if you're on the train, having your back against the wall, not standing on the edge of the platform. I see a lot of people that just kind of like, like to wait on the edge, I just don't understand it. Right? Yeah. I like to keep my back so I can, you know, no one's behind me, right? We're getting a lot of people lately getting pushed, so yeah. those are some things that can really save your life or save you be aware of who's in your personal face the space don't have your head buried in a phone yeah. for example what about kids Adam you work with a lot of young students what do you teach them you have to make a scene if you if someone picks you up and takes you you got to say this is not my mom this is not my dad and and just be loud make a scene make sure people are looking at you mm -hmm. um, and then keep that contact with your parents right a lot of kids like to walk around with their head in their screens and they don't really they kind of lose that that touch with their parents and make, keeping that contact mm -hmm. keeps that form of awareness as well like like Sharice was saying is is being aware of your surroundings same thing take your head out of the phone take your he head out of the iPad yeah and practice like that. that with your kids right practice yelling or breaking away absolutely okay we're gonna absolutely. do some practicing too yes. Sharice let's say someone does get a hold of you what are some techniques for getting away um, so some basic techniques uh, say someone grabs you right mm -hmm. they grab you with with one hand yeah right you want to work against the thumb all you got to do is just pull out the thumb pull really out. okay yeah, just no, pull out your no, thumb no, pull oh. your arm out Go, oh, pull. pull out of the thumb look at that ah, I can't. so that's a weak point yeah. in your hand the thumb yeah that's oh, a weak point got it okay right? or if someone say they grab you two hands right. now you're like okay I can't pull out with right. just one grab your own fist grab, grab my own fist now pull out oh Boom. okay so right? use my own body weight to help. another thing like someone grabs you I grab you. That's easy. I don't want to. Right here. Yeah. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. And all you do is just you grab, you pull away, and you pu and you pu pull your body back. You push away. So I push right? away off of you. So yeah. you grab my shirt. So I grab, push. And I have to push away yeah. from you. Right. Okay. Grab me. Gotcha. Okay. Yes. Right. I'm just here. Uh huh. Push off. Okay. Right? Got it. Pretty simple. Right? Yeah. I like that. The thumb is an easy one. Yeah. Just you to just grab work out of there or use your hand. Okay. Very mm -hmm. good. So I know you have some simple moves too that we can practice aside from those getaways. Yes. But you know you're trying to buy time so you can get away. You're not trying to get into a big fight with this assailant, yeah. right? No. So show me some simple things that anyone can do. Okay. Okay, so a uh, couple basic striking tips. Um, you want to stick with, with our, our super basic strikes. Uh -huh. Our super basic striking is not punching. It's actually not punching. A lot of people, when they try to punch somebody, will break their own hand. Because they're doing it the wrong yeah, way. They'll yeah. do it the wrong way. Even, I mean, even boxers break their own hand because they oh. punch so hard, right? It's, it's just the, the force, and, and maybe you're not holding your fist the right way. So we like to, to teach very, very basics at the start. So first would be the hammer strike. Hammer strike is very, very powerful. You're using, using the fat part of your hand right down by your pinky, and you just drive it like a hammer. Right, she comes right down on top of the head, bang, that's where it is. Uh, next one is your palm strike, like the palm heel. You don't want to slap high five, mm -hmm. right? I want down here. And mm -hmm. you throw it just like a punch. We teach the punch and the palm strike that the only difference is your hands open and close. So she comes right straight okay. and hits the palm and make sure we're, yep, hitting down here right by the wrist. Okay. Um, and then another one that we teach for, for our basic self defense is the groin kick. Right. All right. We, we call it a point kick. Yeah. Um, just to, to get away from doing our traditional front kick. So when Sharice throws a point kick, there's no, there, there's tech beat behind you because you're pushing off right. of the foot. Pointing you your foot, yep, yeah. You point your foot, and you're not hitting with your foot. You want your shin. Oh, okay. You want you want the most leg possible okay. doing the damage, Got right? It. And the shin is the is a hard part of the leg, so that's your best best bet. Is okay, so not the, the ballerina toe. You want to get close oh, and just yes. use yes. the shin. Yes, the okay. shin is the shin is where, where it's at. So those are pretty simple things anyone can practice. You know, the heel strike. Mm -hmm. You said the hammer, right? The hammer, the hammer fist, hammer yep. fist down, mm -hmm. and then that just that, that point, point kick, kick, but really going with the shin. Yep, yep. three basic ones, it's nice and easy. If you're in tight quarters, the only the 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 one that we didn't talk about was the elbow strike. Oh, okay. The elbow strike, if you're in really, really tight quarters, right, bang. This is, wow. and you notice how she's... Yeah, okay, that's intense. Just, yes. Okay. <laughs> I try to pull me in. Right. Uh, so, it, and it's, yeah, you, you just hit right sharp, and it's right a very, here. yeah, it's a sharp cut. And what are you pressure. aiming for? Should you be aiming for anything? Or With just... an elbow, you can hit wherever you want on the head, it's going to hurt. Okay. It's going to stun them. I mean, it, it is, it is... 
uh, a very very hard, hard part, of your, part of your body to hit with. Okay. All right. But if you if if you have the ability to aim, mm -hmm. you want to go for the nose. Right. You want to go for the temple. Mm -hmm. Go for the chin. Okay. Uh, if you if you're Good enough, you go for the, the, the throat. Right, what if right you're there? small? Like, I'm smaller than you. What should I be doing? Because I, maybe I can't get up there. Well, for, for smaller, it, it changes. It mm -hmm. changes. You can reach up with a hammer strike if you need to, and, and your, your point of contact changes. So if, if Miss Reese goes low, she gets shorter, go, go shorter. Now she's striking up. Right. Now, and it's not necessarily the front of the face, but if she throws a palm strike right here and lifts my chin up. Yeah. That's... That's where the power is, and then more access to the throw the here. Throw, huh? Yep, and then you're even closer to the groin. Right. So you have, you still have points of contact that you can make. You don't need to be face to face. And that gives her time to, to get away. Correct. This is one, one, a couple good shots, and you're out of there. Okay. I think we have a little time. Did you want to demonstrate that throw? This is for sure. an advanced move, right? But yeah. This is this is an advanced move. Right. And, and she's just like slow. You want to do the hip throw? <laughs> you want to do a, a double leg takedown? You do a hip toss. Hip toss. Hip toss. Here we go. All right. Go. So there's a lot of different ways to do the hip toss. Mm -hmm. All right. So. Uh, what she's going to do, she grabs, she, she's going to gain control first. She steps in. Okay. When she steps in, now look, see how the hips are lined right, up? Right. She wants her hips just a little bit lower than mine, feet inside of mine. Okay. Right? The feet's got to be inside. This is her base. Now uh -huh. all she's got to do, don't throw me yet, just lift me up. So watch how she lifts me. It's with her legs. Right. It's just with the legs. Okay. Nice and easy lift. Now right. when she wants to throw, she throws. There you go, over. Yeah. Okay. And she keeps the control of the arm. Right. <laughs> okay, wow, okay, so that's not recommended for beginners, <laughs> but that's just something cool you can do if you're two, two black belts. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you. Adam Ladd, Cherise King, such a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much thank for you very all much. of those techniques. Oops, thank you thank so you. much. Giving me a chance to get into a gi. Absolutely. That is our time for now. Thank you for hanging out with us, for all of us at NBC News. I'm Vicki Wynn. Join us next time for another edition of Consumer Confidential. In the meantime, practice some of these techniques and stay safe out there. Oh, oh, hi there. Craig Melvin here, filling in for Al Roker on this episode of Family Style. And today, well, today we're talking, talking all about one of the country's most popular desserts and a holiday staple. We're talking about pie. And as a, a Southerner and a pie lover, pecan, pecan here, it's my favorite, not pecan, pecan. So this assignment was almost too good to be true. From our Thanksgiving tables to our 4th of July barbecues to Christmas and the winter holidays, pie is central to so many of our celebrations. Homemade or baked at, at wonderful shops like this one called Michelle's Pies in Connecticut. Americans sure have strong fillings for pie. See what I did there? But how did we become a nation of pie people? Join me as I slice into the significance of this iconic dessert and piece together how and why different pies are so important to communities across this country. Mm. Time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Yes, pecan might be my favorite, but this, this is my second favorite. I'm a huge fan of a good old-fashioned sweet potato pie. And I'm not alone. For millions of black Americans, making a sweet potato pie is a meaningful tradition this time of year. And in Minneapolis, one woman stopped selling her highly sought after sweet potato pie and with the help of her family, started giving them away for free. Now, through her nonprofit, she is bringing generations together to bake and then gift her tasty pies. It's a recipe for spreading love and creating meaningful connections. You could say they're baking the world a better place. Here's to the joy of our blackness, our beauty, Ooh. our energy, our power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just being able to come together in unity. Onward. 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 That's Rose McGee, the founder of the Sweet Potato Comfort Pot. On a fall morning, a group of women gathered at her home just outside Minneapolis. I appreciated young Brittany Wright uh, approaching me and saying, Miss Rose, you really should 
teach us young women how to make sweet potato pie. I'll just take a little piece of the shell itself and just slide it in there and that'll pull it right out a lot easier than trying to use a spoon because it's thicker. Gotcha. Passing a tradition from one generation to the next. Mama Rose is really good at bringing people together, making them feel welcome and having a sense of belonging. And so I thought it'd be really cool on my birthday to bring a bunch of women together, sharing experiences, learning how to bake pies, learning something from the African-American tradition. Each attendee will be making three pies to share with their community, one to keep, one to gift to an elder, and one to gift to someone younger than them. Once we got the first batch of sweet potatoes boiling, I started exhaling. When you peel, always go to the tip, and then it just pulls right off. For Rose, sweet potato pod is not just dessert, it's a catalyst for connection, one that she considers sacred. It seems like it's all about the pie, but really the pie just happens to be the sweet spot that brings people together. I used to sell the pies years ago. No idea that one day I would feel compelled to give them away. Not to sell them, but to give them away. I started Sweet Potato Comfort Pie in 2014, not really realizing that that's what I was doing. After the killing, of young Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. And I was sitting there watching television, like felt this calling. I obeyed that calling and made about 30 pies, packed them in my car, and my son Adam drove down with me. But what I discovered was people wanted to be heard and listened to. They wanted to feel that um, they were being respected. So I took that to heart and brought it back home. Back in Minneapolis, when George Floyd was killed, Rose stayed up all night baking pies to take to the memorial site to help her own community heal. And I didn't know what to do except make some pies. And that's why I know it's, it's, it's not just about me. It's bigger than that. Is anybody really gonna respond to that? And people do. The organization's mission is to strengthen and cultivate relationships with the solidarity and story sharing that is part of making and receiving the pie. I'm not trying to over emotionalize <laughs> anything, but I will say it's something when people allow you to feel purpose mm -hmm. and allow you to see That's beauty it. within yourself. The sweet potato pie we know today was inspired from West African cuisine and dates back centuries. To get to the root of its origins, we must first talk about yams. I'm Rossi Nastapulo. I'm the author of Sweetland of Liberty, A History of America in 11 Pies. So a yam is an old world crop and a sweet potato is a new world crop. And so yams are really an important part of the West African diet. Whereas sweet potatoes, they are grown kind of on this side of the world. In the United States, sweet potatoes grew abundantly in the South. Enslaved black Americans tended to these crops and cooked with them, contributing to many of the sweet potato recipes we know today. However, credit to black chefs and cooks didn't come until the late 1800s. There was Melinda Russell's A Domestic Cookbook and then Abby Fisher's what Mrs. Fisher knows about old Southern cooking. And so these are two black authored cookbooks that included recipes for sweet potato pie and really were an opportunity for these black chefs and cooks to reclaim their knowledge and have the credit given to them. When emancipation comes, they continue to make sweet potato pie and this time they were making it for themselves, their families and their communities. So you're just gonna put in a third of the way. For those close to the sweet potato comfort pie, it's what's in the batter that really truly matters. Antoinette Pearson Edinger is a pastry chef and helps manage the kitchen at Sweet Potato Comfort Pie gatherings. I was at the first meeting in here in Rose's living room. When I was growing up, if there were some trauma in a family or some celebration in a family, you went down the street with the pies in your hand to present to the family that was either in need or is celebrating and communicate with the folks that are there. She, oh, the pies are ready. <laughs> <laughs> 
Today, back in Rose's kitchen is one of those celebrations in honor of Brittany's birthday. What I appreciate about this, we have been in responsive mode. We try to respond to these crises that happen across the country and locally. So to do something more celebratory is very uplifting and very inspiring for us all. It's a sisterhood. Through these pies, through Mama Rose, we're able to celebrate each other, empower each other, encourage each other, and we're doing it in a way through unity. The future of sweet potato comfort pie, I believe, is a good one. Everybody has this need of wanting to connect, and when you're baking a pie, you just, you're gonna connect. The heart of the comfort pie connection is love and a commitment to greater good. And of course, always keeping their eyes on the pie. When in doubt, bring a bunch of black women into the kitchen and we'll figure it out. Coming up, a family in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, whose ancestors helped invent a sticky dessert that's still being served up today. Welcome back to Family Style and another pie rich with history and a little sugar as well. Some say the origin of this pie known as shoe fly can be traced back to a cake, specifically the Centennial Cake. It first appeared in Philadelphia circa 1876, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. And while the exact origins of the shoe fly pie are lost to time, no matter how you slice it, it is a true American original. In the heart of Pennsylvania's bucolic Amish country lies a town with a name that sounds like a familiar adage. Burton Hand is nestled in Lancaster County. A lot of farming, a lot of agriculture, and a lot of really good, hardworking people. It just has a peaceful and calm feeling. It just envelops you. Bird in Hand isn't just the name of this small village, it's also the namesake of a family-owned corporation that runs a group of lodges, a campground, and eateries. John Smucker runs the business. Under his wings, the Bird in Hand Bakery and Cafe, best known for its shoe fly pie. Raised Mennonite, John and his wife Myrna have deep roots in this neck of the woods. My family's story in Pennsylvania begins in 1752 when my immigrant ancestor, Christian Schmucker, uh, emigrated from Switzerland and Germany, came to America, established a farm homestead here in Lancaster County. And I'm the eighth generation. Pennsylvania Dutch refers to immigrants who came to the U.S. from German-speaking countries in the 18th and 19th centuries, mainly to escape religious persecution in Europe. By the late 1700s, 
It's estimated that these immigrants accounted for more than a third of Pennsylvania's population. No, that'd be the new farmers. He's out there doing it. John's ancestors, along with countless others, brought with them new types of cuisine and helped invent that sticky dessert that's famous in this region, shoe fly pie. The origins of shoe fly pie are a little bit murky. One historian traces it back to Centennial Cake, which was made in the 1800s as a celebration of Pennsylvania's centennial. Shoe fly pie, an apple pan, and it makes your eyes light up. And so that was a crustless version that then once it becomes placed in a crust to become more easily transportable, that turns into shoe fly pie. The Smucker family has been serving up their family's shoe fly pie to the public for more than 50 years. And they've been baking it for much longer. But what exactly is shoe fly pie? I'd start with delicious. The topping is different, so it's not so sweet pecan pie with no pecans. <laughs> shoe fly pie is a type of molasses pie. It's really a product of Pennsylvania Dutch cuisine, and it's distinguished by its inclusion of streusel, which is very classic to those types of European cuisines. On the frontier, they had a limited amount of ingredients, a limited amount of resources, and so one of the products that they would have had was molasses, and molasses was stable. Most shoe fly pies include molasses. The smuckers, however, do things a little differently. We do not use a molasses product for our shoe fly pie. We gravitate towards a light table syrup. Another unique feature of shoe fly pie, the traditional ingredients don't require refrigeration, making it a convenient treat for the many Amish residents in this part of the country. That's Anna Mary Smucker, or to those who knew and loved her, Grussy. Uh, my grandmother, Anna Mary Smucker, was the one who I would say was the ultimate pie baker in our family. I'm sure she picked up recipes from her mother who picked them up from her mother before that. In a 1938 edition of National Geographic on the Pennsylvania Dutch, Grussy was even featured with four of her kids, including John's dad and a shoe fly pie. John comes from a long line of bakers, influenced by his grandparents and his parents. My mother was a pie baker, so she was a busy cook and a housekeeper. And my father was out on the farm and doing different businesses, and so she uh, was busy in the kitchen taking care of the family. In 1970, John's father, Paul, opened the family's first restaurant. There, they started serving the family's signature pie to locals and tourists. In the mid-80s, John opened another nest for foodies, Bird in Hand Bakery and Cafe, just to keep up with the soaring demand for their baked goods. Pumpkin pie, shoe fly pie, and cherry crumb pie. Ah, uh, I just love pies. The pies here are all made from scratch, including the ooey gooey wet bottom shoe fly, using Smucker's recipe that's been passed down for generations. And apparently, this pie isn't just for dessert, I have it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, uh, not necessarily every day. What's delicious on the plate first needs to take shape. And we like our shoe fly pies to be sweet and smooth. There are two main components, the goo and the crumbs. The wet filling is made with hot water, light table syrup, light brown sugar, baking soda, and eggs. It's stirred with a canoe paddle-sized kitchen tool. So to us, the goo is one of the most important features of the pies. That filling is poured into a homemade pie crust. The pie's signature crumb topping is made with pastry flour, light brown sugar, cinnamon, salt, and shortening, which is combined in a large mixer. Crumbs go on top, and then this goo is down below in a layer that's about a half an inch thick. When we bake it, the crumbs work down through into the pie a bit and um, help to create what I call that middle layer. Back when Grussy made her pies, she didn't shoo the grandkids away. She just let us dig in. After about an hour in the oven, the pies are cool, covered, and carried right from the kitchen to the bakery. While visitors to this bakery savor unforgettable flavors and a pinch of the past, for John and his family, the pies are symbolic of so much more. My grandmother would always say, give good measure. 
She was a very hospitable person. I see pies as part of hospitality. These folks are proudly carrying on a unique Pennsylvania Dutch tradition here in the land known as Bird and Hand. Coming up, a New York City baker's quest to bring back a long lost Christmas time pie. Pie today, gone tomorrow. That's what, that's what seemed to be the fate of a beloved bygone Christmas time pie. It was popular for, well, a New York minute. Well, I guess a few decades to be exact. But today, one bakery in New York City is bringing back this long forgotten chestnut rum and cherry creation called Nestle Road. It's not your traditional pumpkin, apple, or, or blueberry dessert, but it is a treat that many older New Yorkers probably remember from childhood. Served up with a slice of nostalgia and a memory of decadent New York. Our motto at PD's is damn fine pie for damn fine people <laughs> because we're just so proud to be a New York business. Pie has been a part of New York's culinary history the entire time and we just wanted to elevate it the best we could. I'm Petra Paredes and I am the owner and head baker of PD's Pie Company. PD's Pie, named after Petra's childhood nickname, has been serving up damn fine pie since opening in New York City in 2014. We opened up the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. We sold like 100 pies. And then the next year, we sold 1,000 pies. This past Thanksgiving, nearly a decade after opening, Petey's sold 10,000 pies. The big holiday rush isn't new to Petra. She grew up pulling all-nighters before Thanksgiving in the name of pie. Pie has been part of my life since I was born. I was born into my parents' bakery. <laughs> they have a bakery called Mom's Apple Pie Company in Virginia. And I always spent my Thanksgivings working at their shop. They are still in business and they still do tremendous Thanksgiving business. Petra inherited a love of baking from her dad. My dad is really obsessive about quality of ingredients and that's something that I have learned from him to just be really focused on flavor and on like the texture and balance in a pie. Petra left the family pie business and moved to New York City to pursue a career in teaching. It was at the end of my first year of teaching that I met my husband, Robert. Seemingly, against all odds, it was poker that brought Petra 
back to Pa. He, interestingly enough, was playing poker <laughs> professionally at the time. He wanted a place to invest his poker money. <laughs> and so I sort of half-jokingly asked him if he wanted to open a pie bakery with me. Robert didn't call her bluff. And he said yes. We'd been dating a few weeks <laughs> at the time. <laughs> and we spent the next three years planning it. Petey's menu offers the classics like apple, banana cream, key lime, and also a beloved bygone pie. The couple's love of culinary history led to Nesselrode's discovery and return. One of the things that Robert and I used to do as we were planning our business was we would look at the New York Public Library's menu database, which is really fun. And one pie that we kept seeing over and over that we had never heard of and never tried and weren't sure how to pronounce <laughs> was Nestle Road Pie. It was on a lot of sort of mid-century menus from the 1940s through the 1960s. This elusive pie piqued Petra's interest. Stumbling across Nestle Road on these old menus was sort of like uh, discovering a fossil or something. Petra saw this as a chance to bring back a piece of decadent New York. Her curiosity inspired a sweet revival. Nestle Road wasn't always a pie. It actually started as a frozen custard dessert in sort of the Victorian ages. It's a very decadent thing to have a frozen dessert before, you know, refrigeration was widely available. It was like the most fancy dessert you could imagine. First off, it was named after a Russian diplomat by his private French chef. Not to mention its luxurious ingredients of chestnuts and liqueur. Years later, the Big Apple heavily influenced the evolution of this decadent dessert. It went from a pudding mold to a pie crust. It sort of transformed in New York City in around the 1940s by this woman named Hortense Spire. Baking the pies from her Upper West Side brownstone, the pie quickly gained popularity. She made pies for like all of the fancy New York City restaurants, all the steakhouses and all the fancy fish seafood restaurants. The pie was a mid-century marvel. As demand grew and the pie became a New York City diner and sweet shop staple, many renditions no longer included chestnuts. By the mid-60s, it all but faded into oblivion. Nestle Road is one of Petey's holiday season offerings, but the supply is limited. Because it's so labor intensive, we can only make 80 over the course of the week. In creating her Nestle Road pie recipe, Petra sought to honor the origins of the dessert. I wanted to bring that chestnut uh, part of the flavor profile and bring it sort of front and center. My recipe is almost sort of a mashup of the sort of Hortense Spire 1940s era and the New York Diner 1960s era. All of Petey's pies start with the same crust. My crust is based on my dad's recipe. It pushes the limits with one ingredient. My crust recipe has like a eight to nine ratio of butter to flour, which is really high. Next up, preparing the chestnuts for roasting. I puree the chestnuts with sugar and with rum, and that is sort of the base note flavor of the whole pie. The filling's light, delicate texture is achieved using gelatin. It's sort of like a, a chiffon or like a fluffy custard kind of pie. The filling is then chilled. We did like a Swiss meringue. The meringue is folded into the filling. Time to top with ganache. And of course, the final step, a cherry on top. They're actually sour cherries. When I hear that somebody um, who hasn't tried Nestle Road Pie since, they, since the 1960s tried my Nestle Road Pie and loved it and just got a sense of nostalgia out of it, it really sort of brings a, a whole other layer of meaning into, into the work that I do. Outside of the bakery, Petra and Robert are raising three little pie people with a fourth on the way. My kids are really into pie. They really love to eat pies. 
As for if their kids will share a slice of the shop one day. Who knows if they'll want to continue the pie business. I look forward to passing on everything that I know, just like my parents did, and, um, and seeing if they're interested. For most Americans, it seems that there's always room for pie, and the significance of that slice can adapt to circumstances, places, and people. Through pie, it seems